Am I? Yes, one can hear me. Nice. Good, good. Hi. Okay. Um, yo. Yeah, we'll just start, I would say. Um, yeah. I would just start. Yeah, okay. Just tell me when you're back. I mean, I can just play it. Yeah. Yo. Okay, nice. Hello, I'm June Reith. And I'm Kyle Thompson. And I'm C. Derek Varn. And you're listening to General Intellect Unit. This time we are reading about John Boyd. Um, a, th a thing we've been threatening to do since basically the beginning of the show. Um, we're going to be reading a chapter from a book. So the, the book is titled Science, Strategy and War, The Strategic Theory of John Boyd by Francis Singa. And the chapter we're reading is chapter six, The Core Arguments, um, which is a big kind of condensed summary of what's going on with Boyd. But in this episode, we'll be reading the first half of that chapter because it's a kind of a monster. Um, so yeah, uh, Derek, what was your general impressions of all this stuff? I found it fascinating from a, from a person who's been interested in conflict theory and, and conflict systems for a long time. Um, but I also found it interesting how this could be employed. So the first thing I read was like, oh, this is about um, institutional flexibility, uh, revitalizing institutions, pushing to the edges, understanding the terrain and the map are separate, all, all that good stuff. But I could totally see how someone could use this to, say, neoliberalize the military and bring in a bunch of contractors and, you know, wage a war in Afghanistan where you don't even learn Pashto. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, yeah, uh, Kyle, because uh, you, you kind of brought this to the table. Um, what's, what's, the, what's the big thing here that we're, we're paying attention to? Um, yeah, so I think there's a, there's a few reasons why we might be interested in Boyd. Uh, uh, so I think, you know, he was very heavily influenced by cybernetics, by systems theory, um, and also by uh, Marxists, uh, especially Leninists. So um, Lenin and Mao in particular. Um, now, of course, uh, Boyd was not a... Uh, Marxist, <laughs> uh, <laughs> to say the least. Um, but I think that his use of cybernetics and systems theory to understand conflict really helps to uh, maybe complement beer uh, because it focuses so heavily on how the uh, social organism uh, interacts with its environment in order to survive. Um, so beer similarly has a really big influence on survival, but is, is much more uh, focused on internal organization uh, and, um, you know, obviously talks about the environment a lot, talks about being sensitive to the environment, but doesn't really talk about the sort of the, the types of actions that are needed to survive as much. Um, whereas Boyd being a military theorist, um, is, is very interested in some dimensions of that. Uh, so I think they have a lot of overlap, but they're looking at this problem from two somewhat different perspectives. Yeah, I think so. I think that's definitely the case, right? Cause like, um, I, I, th I think maybe it's, it's also worth emphasizing, like, Boyd's thing is all about conflict, right? And it's, it's like you, if you're if you're organizing something along the kind of Berean lines, you probably maybe shouldn't take too much from Boyd because you might end up creating internal conflict. You know, it's it, the, the conflict orientation is um, complementary to the kind of internal coherence dimension of beer, uh, but don't get them mixed up. <laughs> is is what I'd advise uh, for people like trying to organize things. I'll just say uh, that there, there are, there's, it's interesting that in a way, as far as internal conflict goes, uh, Beer is actually more sophisticated than Boyd is uh, because Beer takes all of this stuff about like mutually vetoing systems 
and, you know, all of that kind of thing from uh, human physiology um, and tries to integrate that into his theory. Whereas Boyd kind of assumes away a lot of that stuff uh, in a way that is a little bit less sophisticated, I'd say. I think this is uh, where the teleological orientation of theorists really matters. And I know, you know, Brigham, classical Aristotelian terminology is kind of lame, but I, I think it is important. It, you know, Beer is focused on eudaimonia and on relatively stable social systems that make ethical use of human beings. Um, Boyd is a Hobbesian, like almost all soldiers. Um, and, and I say that because in, in a real sense, if your focus is conflict between states, um, the, the, the Hobbesian calculus doesn't really apply to actual human beings, but it actually kind of does apply um, to, to states. But, you, you know, a military strategist is not going to be particularly interested in conflicts within the state. That is not their prerogative. That's not their orientation. Um, so, I mean, in a way, this is just proof that, like, what you're designing for really matters. Um, and, and I think it's a good lesson to learn from contrasting Beer and Boyd. And I, but... You know, th there's also a way in which the internal external conflict thing, and uh, maybe this will come up on a, on a, when we actually discuss the, the 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 conflict patterns, but that that distinction actually is a little bit artificial, and I think beer might be more helpful about understanding that um, because states are artificial. I mean, in, in a real sense, states are real abstractions, like they are. They are things that don't actually exist, but have massive apparatuses that, because we believe they exist, they actually do. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, it's they're, they're both imagined communities with real guns. Um, and whereas when you deal with actual, like, immediate social systems, there's a lot more nuance and, and, and uh, ways to generate conflict. I mean, to, to generate and dissipate conflict um, that that someone like Beer is more interested in handling and making sure it doesn't spiral the system into collapse or into overcomplexity, um, which, which is also something that Boyd is worried about, because Boyd is worried about, like, the focus on traditional attrition warfare leading to both, you know, to mammoth complexities that just get people killed for no reason, you know? Uh, I guess there's a sort of angle in that where also, um, because Boyd is coming from a military perspective, he can assume as a ground truth that basically every there's inter, there's a high degree of internal coherence because everyone's been through the same training and everyone's getting paid um and that everyone's kind of on the same page and on the same team from the start um and so he doesn't need to th think quite as much about um kind of internal dynamics in inside that kind of system you know i i i i i think he He's certainly aware of the importance of harmony, uh, quote unquote, like the, the, the term he uses is harmony to refer to uh, like esprit de corps and uh, a common uh, intellectual background, a common worldview uh, that will bring people together. Um, so he's aware of the, the, the problem of a lack of cohesion and how incredibly, uh, disruptive that can be to a, a conflict effort. Um, but I think he's like incredibly for someone who basically spent his whole adult life in the U S military is, much less attuned to uh, the realities of bureaucratic infighting than mm. beer is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> when, you know, like mm. the U.S. military is like the largest uh, bureaucracy <laughs> in the world, and uh, Boyd certainly was no stranger to that kind of fighting. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting blind spot. I, I think it's almost... Uh, not to go Cerulean on us, but like it's almost because it's like the assumption that Boyd has to have is this myth of 
of internal cohesiveness for for his military vision to work um and and that we're just going to bracket that one element out because we can't deal with it in terms of external conflict um and, and that would make sense in terms of military strategy but it would be a terrible way to build a a military system and maybe that's why Boyd has been used the way he's been used because <laughs> I mean yes. as I mentioned off air I mean John Boyd in a way it becomes the theorist of Ashcroftization of the military which is using auxiliaries using contractors contracting out but without without realizing that not only are you dealing with this massive bureaucracy within the military, but now you're expanding it to sub bureaucracies that are going to be in competition for resources. So you've got like power, power to the edges, right? Which becomes just like the, the ultimate power to the edges is just like turn the whole thing into a fucking market and um, push it out into contractors and, and outsourcers. Right. I mean, and you know, to, to, to speak humanities jargon uh, for a second, Boyd is picking up on the ribosomation of the military. Like if you, like you have an overly centralized, overly, overly brittle, uh, bureaucracy, then you need to make it more adaptive. Um, and I do think it's interesting that he studies Lenin and Mao because what he studies is what Lenin and Mao do, not actually what they say, because, because what Lenin and Mao say is actually the whole Marxist tradition after the First International of encouraging everything to be set along the lines of the Prussian general staff and hyper-centralization and massive wars of attrition. That is, what, that is the language of the Vanguard Party. That is the language of um, the way that these were, these ideas were set up in the way that a lot of a lot of Marxists still think about efficiency. They, they still think about it in a very 19th century mode. And they talked about it that way. Both Lenin and Mao did. But that's not what they actually did. Like, and Boyd picks up on that. Like, you know, in a way it makes, in a way it makes this great irony where like, you know, one of the, the American military strategists is the person who learns the most from, from Lenin and Mao where all that, uh, that we have learned is slogans. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's wild. <laughs> yeah, well, I I think it's I, I think he it's it's not that he completely dismisses the writings of Lenin and Mao or, or Marx for that matter, because uh, there there is definitely a way in which like the 18th Brumaire is a very Boydian text, and I think that it 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 does figure into his thinking, um, but uh, he kind of sorts through the bullshit, right? Because or he filters it according to his point of view, which is this very Hobbesian point of view. So, you know, he's reading them in a way that Marxists certainly would not. Um, so, like, because I do think there's stuff in Boyd that, like, you know, it comes out of, like, the, the Little Red Book, right? It, 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 it comes out of some of Lenin's political writings, but it's it's kind of like not the main theme uh, or the main presentation of either of their perspectives on how to organize. Um, it's, it's more like, oh, you know, like, you know, uh, the stuff that Mao took out of uh, Schwunze, like, like about morale and stuff like that. It, 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 you know, that kind of thing is important. Uh, and, and he grabs that as opposed to grabbing uh, like combat liberalism, right? I mean, it's 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 interesting that um, it's another thing you can learn from applying these theories to the way Mao actually operated conflict, though, because if you looked at how Mao tried to build the state, um, it is very similar to how he tried to win a war, which is great for winning a war and terrible for building a stable state, which even the the even the CPC will admit today. Um, so it's, it's, it's interesting that, you know, you have, I remember I talked to a, a Canadian military theorist about 15 years ago, who I think was a borderline fascist, frankly, but he was obsessed with Mao. But what he took away from Mao was Sun Tzu and then the legalist, the legalism um, that, was, that was kind of in it, both explicitly and implicitly from Chinese context, not anything Marxist. And Boyd reminds me of that. Like, 
Um, what, what, what he takes from Lenin is, you know, uh, about revolutionary defeatism and tipping points and, and, and stuff like that. Not anything about how to build, um, a state or, or anything like anything out of state and revolution or anything like that. It's, it's more, it's more the immediately pragmatic thing of building a militant subject, um, but I think it's also interesting when we talk about the comparison between Boyd and Beer to look at what these figures do when they try to build societies versus when they try to win wars, which is traditionally why um, the military itself has kind of if, if, if the stronger the military, the, usually the, the bigger the bigger insistence on on. Um, civilian leadership because the practice of the military to build a state are often endemic to building a state. And it's kind of like, obviously so. I mean, that's not what, that's not what the organization is designed to do. It's designed to fight. Um, and, and this, this is something that, uh, you know, you, uh, and there's a there's a fundamental truth to all state power does come out of, particularly in the modern nation state comes out of the barrel of the gun. But there's also a truth that like if that's all you're doing, your state's not going to last very long. Yeah, I think um, you know the the sort of the example that gets referred back to again and again uh, in terms of state building uh, by military is the uh, post war occupation of Japan. But it's very important to understand that, like, that state building wasn't done by the U.S. military, really. It was done by, like, cooperation between Japanese elites and a sort of intellectual and not very martial subsection of the u.s military <laughs> um, it, it, it's really not a military thing yeah as similarly if you look at the writings of someone like um neil ferguson who you know horrible british neoconservative but he actually points out when his book on empire and why why he thought the u.s sucked at it um was that um the British realize that you can't have the military set up all the bureaucracies because they'll be set up along military lines and civilian bureaucracies don't work along military lines. Like it's, it's a, it's a basic, what is the function of this institution? Why would you bring that function into these other things? And this is something where at least post Vietnam, the U S has just never dealt with that. Like it, it partly, I think structurally because it doesn't want to admit its own imperial ambitions that directly. Um, but partly also because we've outsourced this all to the military, which is not designed or catered nor attracts the kind of people who would be particularly good at designing systems to survive, even in a colonial context. Mm. And like designing systems to survive is kind of the, the reason all this is relevant to socialists is that like, you know, we really should be thinking pretty hard about how to design systems to survive. Right. Um, and I mean, it's been a kind of it's been a thing we've been going on about forever that like you know, leftists just don't fucking think about this stuff and it's super important. So our job is to bring this to the, bring this to the masses, I guess, and get them to at least try to, try to think about some of this kind of stuff. Um, well, I mean, it's something that you have said to me, um, not off air, but is very relevant to hear the way, both in terms of strategy and in terms of institution building, the way most leftists approach this at, is basically sloganeering to activate mass cadres. Right. There's but there's not any other substance to it. There's not there actually isn't a lot of institution building for anything other than that. The 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 accumulation of cadres is not even teleologically oriented towards a specific goal a lot of the time, despite the fact, you know, uh, we want socialism. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, it's mostly psychological functions, really, if we're totally honest. Right. Right. Like, like, well, it's what it becomes, right? It, it, it becomes, it becomes a way of, it becomes a way of like functionally solidifying some kind of secular identity, um, and that's its function. I mean, if we take the cybernetic, you know, operative, that that's what it does. It's the function is what it does. It's not designed to win conflicts. It's not designed to even do something moderate, like decrease the Gini coefficient. Like it's not designed to do any of that. It's it's literally kind of about self orientation and self identity. Um, so how do we apply something like, uh, Boyd's OODA to that problem? Yeah. 
so I guess that's a, that's a good opportunity for a segue. Um, so Kyle, do you want to walk us through some of the basic ideas um, here? Uh, should I give a little bit of a background on who Boyd was just to get, get us in there? Yeah. Uh, so uh, John Boyd, uh, sorry for the late introduction here, but uh, John Boyd uh, was an American. Uh, he was born in 1927 and he died in 1997. Once he sort of reaches adulthood, he becomes a fighter pilot for the United States Air Force in the Korean War. Um, doesn't have a especially distinguished uh, tour of duty, like doesn't really do anything that remarkable. He never becomes a fighter ace, anything like that. He's just kind of there, uh, participates a bit. Uh, and then his career really starts after the war when he becomes an instructor at the Fighter Weapons School, um, which is, you know, a sort of high-end training program. Um, and he comes into his own there and really excels at air combat maneuvering. Um, he gets this nickname, uh, 42nd Boyd, Boyd uh, because he has this running bet that he can take anybody on and beat them in 40 seconds of combat, uh, in air combat. Um, and this sort of starts to influence his intellectual trajectory, uh, because he comes up with these tactics for winning in air combat, because, you know, that's what you do in a training school. You're really thinking tactically. You're thinking about how to learn, uh, the sort of heuristics you need as a pilot. Like this one thing he does is that he loves to fly into the, the sun, get the sun behind his back, which is obviously nothing original in, in air combat. That's like one of the most fundamental maneuvers you could do. Uh, but then he goes and does a ton of uh, really fast maneuvers while the sun is at his back to disorient his enemy and then takes them out. Um, and this sort of basic tactic that he uses becomes the basis for his like intellectual development. Uh, so he becomes the head of the academic section at the fighter weapons school, and he writes their tactics manuals. Um, and you can see based on his writing that he really does get into the academics pretty deeply. Like he's very influenced by his contemporaries uh, intellectually. Um, Wides quite uh, reads reads quite widely, and like you know, he's he's read probably a lot of this stuff that uh, you might have read uh, if you went through like a humanities degree in the late nineties, uh, or, or or even a science degree. <laughs> right, Heisenbergian uncertainty principle stuff that I do remember being a lot more in vogue um, in the nineties and early aughts than now, but I. I think is is interesting how he's even pulling from like this is a principle from physics like yeah he's got he's got a very in that way he has a very air force mentality right it's a very very kind of like scholarly and um uh intellectual um so yeah really you know even though he he's got this kind of military background he's definitely sort of a, an organic intellectual of the military and one that's very, very plugged into academic networks and happenings of his time. Um, so then he goes on to uh, work on the F-15 Eagle program, uh, the development program for that. Uh, and um, essentially this program isn't really satisfactory to them because the US military had this philosophy famously uh following the second world war where they just wanted to make really big heavy fast fighters that could use missiles to take out their enemies um and notoriously the u.s air force did very poorly compared to the soviets and uh other uh enemies um in the korean war and the vietnam war uh, and a lot of this had to do with this design philosophy. Um, so Boyd starts to push back against that philosophy. Um, he comes up with this idea of EM theory or energy maneuverability theory, which is not really that complicated. But if you ever like study to do like a combat flight sim or anything like the the old um, 
what the heck was it? Like the the Falcon 2.0 instructional videos from the 90s with like from Micropros and they have like an actual uh, air combat instructor who gives you lectures on on how to dogfight. Like the one of the first things you're going to learn is EM theory because it's just so basic now to how people understand air combat. Um, but it basically theorizes a trade off between energy and maneuverability. And it suggests this different theory of uh, fighter development uh, to make a lightweight fighter that's very maneuverable. Uh, and this is the F-16, um, which in the prototype phase, uh, where the purpose of the aircraft was to uh, win in dogfights, to win in air combat, uh, it very handily beat its competitors as like prototypes for where the U.S. military could go. It later went on to become like a mixed-use fighter or mixed-use aircraft and had problems because it wasn't doing the thing it was designed to do, actually. Uh, but, you know, this is really a feather in Boyd's cap that, you know, he's done this astonishing thing in the prototype phase, uh, him and, and his other uh, friends, who are similarly uh, a lot of sort of intellectuals. Um after that, he is really famous for his essays and lectures on strategy uh, that are collected in his book, A Discourse on Winning and Losing, uh, which was uh, first published in 1987. Um, and as we said, he's, he's heavily influenced by cybernetics, heavily influenced by system theory, especially uh, influenced by The Art of War uh, by Xuanzi, the the ancient Chinese text that... Uh, comes out of the uh, Warring States period in China um, and uh, the thought of Marxists like Lenin and Mao. Um, he becomes hugely influential throughout the U.S. military after Vietnam, uh, but especially in the U.S. Air Force for all that like EM theory stuff and, and you know, the, 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 the doctrine of air land battle comes out of Boydianism. Um, and he's very influential as well on the U.S. Marine Corps, uh, where he essentially went in and spoke to the leaders of the Marine Corps, and they completely rewrote their doctrine uh, for operations uh, based on Boydianism. He's sort of become like this kind of like a patron saint of the Marine Corps. It's very weird, but... Like, like he's, 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 there's a definite kind of like hero worship about him uh, in the Marine Corps. Uh, so Boyd, uh, interestingly, uh, despite being quite an intellectual, he didn't write any large theoretical books. The uh, Discourse on Winning and Losing is largely just a compilation. Um, and it's mostly just lecture slides that he used in presentations in the U.S. military. Um, Imagining the most boring PowerPoints imaginable as Aristotle's text. Oh, they look so good. They look amazing. <laughs> it's so 90s. I love it. Yeah, not, not <laughs> especially scintillating stuff. Uh, maybe he was a more lively presenter. Um, uh, but... Uh, that's why we are reading Osinga as sort of an interpreter and uh, compiler of Boyd, um, uh, because, you know, there there is no like great Boyd text that you could just go and read. Um, yeah. And uh, so that's that's the basic biography on Boyd. Uh, he's his last uh, major engagement with the U.S. military was working with Dick Cheney to plan the uh, Operation Desert Storm. Um, Arguably the last successful U.S. war. <laughs> yes. Uh, so he does actually have like a kind of a, a successful engagement. Like the fact that the U.S. military did not occupy Iraq it kind of lines up with Boydianism in, in ways um, uh, after De Desert Storm. Um, but uh, yeah, he, he does kind of have that to his name as well. Um, you know, despite it being a horrible bloodbath in many ways. Um, uh, and yeah, he, he kind of goes into retirement, does a little bit of advisory work and then dies in the late nineties. Um, 
and uh, that and then goes on to be used by neoliberals <laughs> to royally fuck up the U.S. military. So we can thank him for that as well. So, yeah, he's been a sleeper, a sleeper agent of anti-colonialism this entire time. No. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but I mean, it is fascinating, though, that um, if you look at his legacy, Everything that he does, you need to use exactly as he lays it out, or it might be worse for you than not doing it. Um, this is also true in his, you know, his, his plane designs, right? Like, it's designed to do a certain thing. It does his thing really well. If you wanted to do other things, it's going to suck at it. It's highly, it's, it's very subtle stuff, right? And if you're not as subtle as he is, um, then there's a pretty big risk that you're just going to get the wrong end of the stick entirely. Yeah. Um, it's, it, it is, uh, I, I think that, you know, it's subtle stuff. And yet also, if you're used to systems theory, when you read it, um, uh, I remember when you, when you get into the, the, uh, the, that 16 page essay, creation and destruction, and you get into the creating concepts and I'm, I'm reading this and going like, I don't know. I think I got this from like a introductory text on systems theory, like from the eighties, like, um, but I also think that the military has not been historically known for operating on systems theory. He was laundering that stuff for them, yeah. I mean, it, it, like, you know, systems theory doesn't really exist without the U.S. military, but at the same time, like... Kind of like how cybernetics doesn't really exist without the Soviet Union. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and the U.S. military. Uh, but, but you know, the thing is that it's, it's like... Uh, that thing where you always have to like understand what the the patron organization is getting out of the intellectuals and what the intellectuals are getting out of the patron organization and you can't assume that those are 100 percent the same thing um because they actually have different interests <laughs> i mean it's one of the things that i find hilarious about also the streaming down of the military is it's not like you saw a massive reduction in military bureaucracy in fact what you saw is the military, instead of providing its own systems, became nothing but a bureaucracy <laughs> um, and, and some fighting forces. And then everything in the middle is outsourced. Um, so it's, it's, it's interesting because it like the, because there's no like real acknowledgement of of what context that Boyd is operating under. He can't predict how stuff is going to be used. Um, which I think is okay. Sorry, for some reason the pot isn't playing. Let me reload, and we are at like okay out of the intellect if we were roughly here let's hope it's loading i mean it's one of the things that i find hilarious about also the streaming down of the military is it's not like you saw a massive reduction in military bureaucracy in fact what you saw is the military instead of providing its own systems became nothing but a bureaucracy <laughs> Um, and, and some fighting forces and then everything in the middle is outsourced. Um, so it's, it's, it's interesting because it like, the, because there's no like real acknowledgement of, of what context that Boyd is operating under, he can't predict how stuff is going to be used. Um, which I think is actually different from some some of the more cybernetics theories who are more in, into looking at internal systems as opposed to conflict systems. I mean, it really is a different debate. Um, Beer is really concerned about how his stuff is going to be used, even if it does sometimes get used in a you know nightmare dystopian logic way. I mean, he thought about it. Whereas you, when you, as we said, when you read Boyd, it's like he just assumes that there's social harmony in the military, and all you, and really your job is to disrupt that harmony on the other side. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and that's one of the that's the kind of core idea that'll keep coming up again and again throughout all Boyd. And like what what the author here is going to do is kind of try to argue that this uh, this this concept, the OODA loop, the O O D A loop, um, is I think sometimes 
when people read Boyd, they think of it as just being a purely tactical thing, but the, the author will build up an argument by following Boyd's actual words that this applies at all kinds of levels from tactics through to strategy and grand strategy. Um, but the, the OODA loop is uh, observe, orient, decide, and act, um, and then go back around the loop again. Observe, orient, decide, and act. And the, the kind of core of Boyd's maneuverist approach to these things is to, you should have a faster OODA loop than your enemy does, and you should speed up your own loop and also try to disrupt and slow down theirs. So you should observe faster, you should orient faster and better, you should decide faster and better, you should act faster and better, but you should also disrupt the enemy's ability to orient themselves, or their ability to decide, or their ability to observe things. Um, and that's the that's the that's kind of the it's the core of the whole thing, right? Um, it's it's a it's a game with two agents, and they both have these loops uh, internally, and generally the one with the faster loop is going to win out. And Boyd would apply this like not just in the military, but it would apply to business litigation, um, law enforcement, anything anything that involves um, opposing uh, antagonistic conflict. This is this is a useful strategic orientation for. Um, and importantly, the, uh, the most important of the four points in the OODA loop is the orient point, the orient phase. Um, so Boyd, uh, says the second O orientation as the repository of our genetic heritage, cultural tradition, and previous experiences is the most important part of the OODA loop since it shapes the way we observe, the way we decide, the way we act. So there's kind of a way in which Boyd strikes me as a bit of an idealist um, because he thinks that like ideas and mental processes are really the most important thing in winning in conflict. Um, but... I think that we can kind of, if we understand the mental processes as emergent out of a physical reality, we can kind of take Boyd without uh, really going entirely on board with the uh, sort of idealism. Now, obviously, Boyd, you know, had a materialistic uh, orientation in designing fighter aircraft and stuff like that. It's just his theory kind of leans in that direction, and I think it could be useful to kind of say, yeah, 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 but this is like this is emergent. This isn't uh, this isn't Hegelianism, right? Um, right. Well, I mean, the fact that he includes genetic heritage as part of the O loop is does indicate that he um, maybe even unfortunately eugenically um, considers biology one of the things from which our ideas emerge, like. That he does take that seriously, um, and unlike a lot of Marxists, he also like takes cultural traditions seriously because he sees them as part of the way we actually orientate our um, uh, our actual like you know social reproduction and the way we we would actually view things. I mean, you, you, I agree with you that this is kind of idealist and it is kind of liberal. Um, what I would what I would push back on, though, is that it corrects a lot of gross, gross, uh, unsympathetic, unemergent determinism that Marxists rely on when they're losing. You know, they never they never actually call it up when they're winning. Um, so I, I think that's an important an important thing. And I don't think it's far into Marx. Like, like I like to point out that even in the vulgar you know, base superstructure metaphor, relations of production, not just modes of production are part of the base and that relations of production are legal cultural constructs. Yeah, I think this, um, I think this definitely works as like, um, there, there, there's a, like a Boyd might be being a bit of a a bit of an idealist, but I think there's a perfectly fine cyber materialist kind of reading of this where the agent is orienting itself on a landscape and that, that landscape is not just like the ground beneath its feet. It's also the enemy and the agent itself and the systems in which the agent is embedded, the material genesis of the agent, like if you read genetic heritage as its kind of material genealogy, um, 
and all of its prior experiences, like the, the new experience from the observation is being compared to prior experiences. Learning is in there. Learning is part of the landscape on which the agent is orienting. Um, I think the other thing to that is probably worth uh, pointing out in this regard is that Boyd is kind of pushing back against the engineer brain of the mid 20th century um, where things are thought about in, you know, basically like quantitative terms of material or uh, like winning a war means killing as many enemies as possible. Uh, like, you know, the the kind of ma like the kind of like McNamaraization of of society uh, is something that Boyd is pushing back against in his moment, and so he's kind of pushing that uh, the 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 Orient dimension um, in order to make a point. Yeah, I mean, I think we do have to talk about how like the 20th century U.S. military, uh, from Boyd's point of view, and we'll go into this more on a on the episode of Patterns of Conflict, was based on the 19th century industrial model, which he thought was disastrous to militaries and, less to, and, le and led to way more people dying in conflict than needed to. Um, you know, on both sides. Like, um, and so the idea of this pure total war of attrition um, doesn't... You know, doesn't flow. Ironically, I, I think it's interesting also to realize that Boyd's not the only, uh, you know, um, war thinker who's thinking about this. Um, I brought up fifth gen warfare a lot, but the fifth gen warfare people talk about why um, insurgents of occupations always have an advantage because of uh, because their their goals can can actually stand way more attrition and they could still win. So you can kill like five to one in an insurgency of occupation, but because of the exhaustion of your own resources uh, over time and because that the the symmetrical stakes are different. So the occupied the, from their point of view, the stakes are total, whereas for the occupier they're not. Um, that uh, you don't like the attrition calculus just doesn't work. And where this began to be thought about the most was Korea and Vietnam. Um, and especially Vietnam. Right. And, and Boyd is not that, but he's coming out of the same response. Like this doesn't work, particularly when fighting guerrilla armies. Well, let's look at, I mean, for Boyd, the study of Mao and, and Lenin is, is in some ways, particularly in the context that this guy is totally coming out of the Cold War. This is like, I must understand why my enemy is winning. Um, uh, yeah, it's worth worth mentioning that Boyd did actually fight in Vietnam. Uh, he was like a, a kind of like a squadron commander for like a, a recon squad. So he was there. Uh, he, he wasn't... Uh, I, I, he seems like the last generation of generals that actually saw active combat. Um, in in the same way, not that uh, the current generals have not served any combat, but if you look at like those who fought in Korea and Vietnam versus those who came up in the eighties and like weird skirmishes in Nicaragua and Grenada, um, it's a completely different military milieu. Um, so that's also interesting. But I mean, I think I think like. Some of the weirdnesses of Boyd, when I think about the way that you're trained to think in the military, and I've never been a soldier, but I used to teach them, um, uh, is that you are trained to look at your enemy as a source of inspiration for your own possible victory. And so, like, when someone like General Miley and Current, I mean, just to tell you how, how cut off all sides of political discourse in America are from reality, but they're like, yeah, we read everything. Of course they do. Like, they read it for tactical advantage. Like, um, and, and I think it's interesting what Boyd learned from that. Um, I, I, think, I think the Orient is, is the most fascinating part. It's also when you see this feedback chart, it comes up as a neat little pentagram. 
where everything else is just a normal flowchart. Yes. Um, <laughs> it's entangled in a way that the others aren't. That, that That's where the magic happens. That's that's where you do your magic summoning <laughs> circle. Uh, so if, if you uh, go to Wikipedia and look up the uh, ODDA loop or the OODA loop, uh, uh, there is a uh, like vector graphics diagram of the loop, um, and it, that's where you'll see this uh, this magic summoning circle uh, that Boyd has in the Orient uh, dimension. I'll embed it in the show notes as well, just so it's it's easy to get to. Yeah, it's it's pretty great. Should we should we move on to um, the Boyd's abstract of a discourse? Yes. Cool, Kyle. What's what's happening here? So this is. Uh, I'll try to be clear here about which sections here are written by Osinga and which sections are written by Boyd because they... C- it's hard to figure out. <laughs> it's You, you, you kind of need to read very carefully to figure it out, yes. Uh, so uh, Osinga here is just kind of like providing a general intellectual framework for reading Boyd. Um and uh, he's commenting on Boyd's abstract from his book, uh, A Discourse on Winning and Losing. Uh, so the things that Osinga uh, draws out here are that uh, Boyd proceeds from the concrete to the abstract um, in his writing um, and uh, takes a, a specific quote from Boyd here. For the interested, a careful examination will reveal that the increasingly abstract discussion surfaces a process of reaching across many perspectives, pulling each and every one apart in analysis, all the while intuitively looking for those parts of the disassembled disassembled perspectives which naturally interconnect with one another to form a higher order, more general elaboration or synthesis of what is taking place. Um, so yeah, uh, kind of, is this, no, sorry, this is from Osinga. This is from Osinga. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, this is his like, okay, this is, this is what, uh, Boyd is doing in his general intellectual effort. Um, and it's a little bit hard to say, like to, for me to tell if Osinga is saying this or Boyd is saying this because, Boyd actually does deal with this explicitly in the next section we're going to read. Uh, so this isn't just like a, like, I, I read Hegel and I'm taking dialectics uh, from there and uh, reading Boyd, which doesn't have anything to do with that, and then uh, uh, giving you this intellectual framework. He's really just summarizing what Boyd is going to say. Mm-hmm. Um yeah. Uh, yes. Shall we shall we roll into it then? Or go ahead, Derek. Yeah. Well, I was actually trying to figure out: um, is this closer? When I was reading this, is this closer to dialectics or to, uh, to abduction, or is it somewhere between both? Oh, I think it's fair to say that. Uh, so, for the readers who don't know, um, abduction is a uh, it's a process whereby you discover things in your research that surprise you. Um, it's it's sort of like out of the research, a new perspective emerges. Um, and it's not in a deductive sense or an inductive sense. It's kind of like, oh, there's a gap here and I see a new perspective. So like when you look at something like... Um, there's a whole empirical school of research in the social sciences that came out of grounded theory and 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 brings in American pragmatism and abduction to try to figure out a better way for social scientists to not just mold reality to fit their interpretive framework or just list a bunch of shit without any um, actual theory emerging out of it. Uh, and so abduction is this kind of focus on where something comes out of the research process that is original and is neither deduction nor induction. But Boyd then makes that process dialectical in that there's a continuous loop of building building up a model, having it being surprised, breaking it down, rebuilding it, and constantly iterating based on surprise. 
Yeah, it reminds me a lot of the section in Marx's forward, one of Marx's forwards to Capital about the method of ascent and the method of descent. Yeah, so it's just, I, th I think this is interesting, and I wanted to bring it up because Boyd's one of these figures where you could read him as an analytic or you could read him as something akin to a continental and misread him, whereas I think both things are going on. Um, and the, and uh, because you, you, we all realize that, like, analytics don't like the dialectic word, and um, even when they're doing it, and... Uh, a lot of people use dialectics to mean they never have to learn standard logic. So I just found that interesting. I was trying to figure out where, where you peeps placed it on that spectrum. And it seemed to me like it was, it was kind of both, but, but in being both, it actually was beyond either one of them. Like it was not because there's a way in which like with traditional dialectics, particularly in the Hegelian form, you can assume what you want to prove um, through through like, well, the, the necessary synthesis is X, um, which is something actually, if you read Marx's critique of Hegel's philosophy in general, despite the fact that kind of reads like a new atheist rant, um, that he's actually going on to, but Marx never felt confident in working out why that was true in Hegel. Like, um, so he never published that critique. Um, but it's, it's an interesting thing to see because I think this is, this is that where like, you're not, you're not assuming, you know, what the synthesis necessarily will be. Um, are the off you boom, if I want to use like the correct before people get mad at me and start yelling about me using incorrect Hegelian dialectic terminology. For Boyd, it's very much um, an outward facing process of discovery where you assume that you're going to be surprised and that you, you, you assume that you won't know where the process will lead which is, as you say, it's quite different from the way this stuff is sometimes used, where it's like, I'm just going to, you know, decide on something up front and then do a wiggly-waggly process to get there. Uh, for, for Boyd, you have to be... I guess it, it, it's, it's from this whole antagonistic kind of perspective, right, where you, you kind of have to assume that you just don't know everything yet and that the world could surprise you. Like, that, that sound of a twig snapping behind you really could be an actual threat that you didn't perceive before, and you need to react to it, take it seriously, you know? There's no presumption that all of this stuff is emerging out of the idea. So, so it takes uncertainty principle and Gurgle's theorem very seriously. Like the idea that you can know something accurately or precise, uh, was it accurate or precisely, but not both. Um, and, uh, and that you, you, you know, there's a real sense that you can't know every neither every factor nor every outcome of a situation, which, which to be honest, if you have dialectics that, that takes that seriously, you know, the kind of emergent dialectics, it's actually a very different thing than the way I'm not going to put this on Marx. I actually don't think Marx is consistently uh, in violation of this, although sometimes he is. Um, I will say that later Marxists just impute that they know what the outcome of a dialectic will be. Like, um, the contradictions of capitalism necessarily mean communism, communism necessarily means the USSR, etc. Um, and Boyd would laugh at that. Yeah, and he'd be right to. Um, so so what, we're, what we're talking about here is the, the section on uh, destruction and creation, which I believe is... Is this just a verbatim reproduction of the essay? Yeah, I think so. That's right. It is. It is It is in the book. Osinga has reproduced verbatim Boyd's essay uh, with uh, footnotes that he has written himself. Uh, sorry, that, that, that Osinga has written about Boyd. So it's very much like a classic, like, here is the text and you get the interpreter's point of view in the footnotes. Um, uh, and... Um, but it's not clear where it starts at first. <laughs> like, like, like it just goes cr destruction and creation introduction. And you're just like, wait, but okay, where am I at? Like who, who's, who, who's, who's, yeah, it's very, very confusing because this chapter is composed of multiple sections and it's only in the section on destruction and creation that Boyd's work is presented verbatim. And the other stuff is Osinga's interpretation. And that isn't marked out in any clear way other than the headings. Um, and, and 
But even the instruction creation heading, the introduction is still written by Osinga, even though it's not tagged as such. You only know that because it mentions Boyd in third person. Yes, that's right. So the point the point here is that um, uh, this is the only essay, like traditional prose discourse that Boyd wrote and included in um, a discourse on winning and losing. So he can, so Zynga can just quote that verbatim, but the other stuff, you can't do that because you need to like fill in what people in Boyd's lectures actually got out of those lecture slides. So does Boyd's text begin at abstract? That's what I think it does, right? Okay. Yes, that's correct. That is correct. Yes. Um, so just as a kind of basic introduction to the, to what this is, uh, this is an essay by Boyd, 16 pages. It's the basis for his subsequent work and thoughts. Um, it is based on mathematical logic, physics, and thermodynamics. Um, it also combines ideas from Gödel's uh, incompleteness th theorem, uh, Heisenberg's uh, uncertainty principle, and the second law of thermodynamics. So, like, pretty much, you know, like the. The, the 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 hits of the of the 20th century right like in terms of in terms of like what are the 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 biggest ideas of what was going on intellectually at that time uh pops that in uh also draws on philosophy of science uh from polanyi uh popper and kuhn uh so you get your your big hits there too um and uses, uh, Osinga doesn't mention this, but definitely uses dialectical reasoning throughout uh, with some structuralism thrown in. Uh, there's a little bit of uh, like old school, basic uh, uh, structuralism, not, not post-structuralism, but like the stuff that actually comes out of like theory of language. Um, yeah, Crowd levi strauss Cesaire, early 20th century structuralism, not Foucault. Um, and then, yeah. It's, it's Boyd's writing verbatim, so we're actually reading Boyd here. Um, so maybe I should just read the abstract, and then we'll get into it. Uh, yeah, so this is very succinct. It's worth reading just verbatim. Uh, so Boyd writes, To comprehend and cope with our environment, we develop mental patterns or concepts of meaning. The purpose of this paper is to sketch out how we destroy and create these patterns to permit us to both shape and be shaped by a changing environment. In this sense, the discussion also literally shows why we cannot avoid this kind of activity if we intend to survive on our own terms. The activity is dialectic in nature, generating both disorder and order that emerges as a changing and expanding universe of mental concepts matched to a changing and expanding universe of observed reality. So very cybernetic um, and very much oriented to the environment and also something that, you know, doesn't really sound like typical U.S. military boilerplate prose. No, it doesn't. <laughs> I was about to say, I could actually, like, I was reading this, I'm like, I could even hear Deepak Chopra say this, unfortunately, mm -hmm. but what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, I mean, I think it's, tr I think as a general principle, it's true enough. Like, you, you're dealing with the fact that your mental constructions of the terrain cannot necessarily, um, be accurate to the actual observed reality because both are changing uh, in dynamic response to each other. So, so like any model that you would have would have to be dynamic enough to change with new observations and thus the model is constantly remaking itself. Um, and I mean, this, this concept, like this sort of thinking and like the, you know, uncertainty principle, all that stuff, quantum mechanics, it, it all got abused by new age thinkers in a pretty serious way, but it doesn't it validate people who are using it necessarily? Uh, just, you just should, uh, you should maybe raise an eyebrow in the, in the same way you do when you see dialectical. Yeah. Re reject woo bullshit, return to Heisenberg. Yeah. <laughs> just go back to the source. You don't need to have any of the woo bullshit. Yeah. Yeah, but it is interesting how, like, when I re when I was reading this, I was like, okay, Derek, this is not woo bullshit. I'm not reading, like, an integralist text. This is actual serious stuff. Because I have seen this kind of thing, 
you know, so many times in that regard. Um, but I, I think what, what's interesting here is you have like an idea of dynamic realism. Like if like I was going to name what, what's actually being described here is like, it is not that you can't, th- there's a way in which, for example, in continental philosophy that they automatically go to the reductio ad absurdum that since you can't, since the model is not the terrain and thought is like a language, which I actually don't believe is actually true, but whatever. Um, if so facto, um, reality is totally subjective. And, and, uh, um, which, which, you know, I guess impressed people in the seventies, but like, that's not what this is at all. Like, this is more like you have to accept that your mental concepts are never going to be precisely mo- like mapping on the terrain and they must, and the terrain is changing itself. It is not a static mechanical world. Yeah, and I, I think this is really similar to um, the sort of groundwork chapters you get in Brain of the Firm. Mm, um, and yeah. Boyd doesn't – or sorry, Beer doesn't um, explicitly state these principles in the same way that Boyd does. But if you look at like what he actually does in the Chilean Revolution, he's definitely putting these ideas into practice. Um it, like he he is thinking in this way, even if he didn't write, you know, destruction and creation uh, exactly. So if we if we sk- skip forward to this small section on when he gets to like because he goes over some of like the basic stuff, like the goal is to survive. Um, you're operating in an environment that's hostile, and as we said before, Boyd is basically it's a Hob- he's a Hobbesian um, through and through. So um, uh, and and that makes him different from Beer, who is an Aristotelian. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and then the, the need for decision arises in this, like, operating in a hostile environment. Um, the OODA loop is necessary for survival. But then if we're observing and we're orienting ourselves um, and then trying to decide and act, then we need to think about how, how are we going to generate our mental concepts? How are we going to generate our map of the world and as best to support the decision-making activities? Um, yeah, so, like, well, just to link this back to the OODA loop it's like if the observe or sorry if the orient phase is the most important part of the loop how do we generate the constituents of the orient phase yeah exactly the the parts of the model that's what that's what boyd is focusing on here yeah um and the creating concepts section kind of gets he, he spells it up pretty explicitly it's very easy to follow um that there are two ways in which we develop and manipulate our mental concepts of observed reality, we either start from the whole and break it down into parts, which is deduction and analysis, or we start from the parts and we build it up into a whole, which is induction and synthesis. Um, and these are the two legs of the process. You're breaking breaking a large concept down into smaller things, or you're assembling Lego parts to make a different concept. Um, yeah, and uh, just to sort of link back to the idea of abduction, that would actually be a third thing that would go in here, but like people weren't really reading Pierce very much at this time. <laughs> so like it's something that comes out of American pragmatism and is <clears throat> really quite obscure at this period of time. It's, it's it gets revived like at the late 20th century. Yes, but it gets revived like in the early aughts, but um but it, it seems like that's part of what what uh Boyd is getting at. Um Yes, yes. He just doesn't have the logical terminology to speak about it. So he's trying to speak about it in terms of deduction and induction. But the, the abduction is definitely the thing that corresponds to the third leg of the, of the process with the suspicion angle that we'll get to later. Which I think is, it was quite interesting. I also think it's, it's fascinating that he, instead of pulling from like classical philosophy, because the specific, the, this is a distinction that goes all the way back um, to you know, Plato and Aristotle. Um, maybe even to Pythagoras. Um, th- he picks on, you know, the difference between calculuses, like integral and differential calculus, which I thought was very useful and in, in not getting into, like, the humanities mystification part, um, that we normally fall into um, by showing that, like, no, this is, you know, like, you see this even practically in different kinds of math. Like, And so he walks us through then, like, okay, imagine... A domain, imagine some concepts, and then imagine another domain and some concepts. Imagine that you 
um, break the things down, like you, 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 you sort of shatter the bindings between concepts and then mix and match across domains, you find the connecting threads, um, and then rebuild a new, con a new kind of synthesis. That's the, so you have, you have a sort of destructive motion of unstructuring your understanding of a domain, and then a constructive or creative um, operation of building up a new understanding based on recombination with other elements. Right, so this is basically Deleuze and Guattari, but without all of the theory speak. Without the without the fucking frog weirdness, yeah. <laughs> yeah, w w without without and without making um, perfectly logical scientific assumptions start to become irrational um, through reassertion. But whatever. Um, but yes, it is. It is like if you took all the bullshit out of Deleuze and Guattari and got to what was good in them, that would be. This is what's good in them. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and so for Boyd, this is the, the uh, for Boyd and Deleuze and Guattari, this is the process of changing our perception of reality with this um, this two stroke process of destruction of concepts and then creation of concepts. Um, but it's it's a process that is um, there are breaks put on this by basically uh, the the need for reality checks and consistency checks that like if if the model of the world is going to be of any use to us, it needs to be internally consistent and it needs to be consistent with the world. Um, so while we're going around this loop, we're constantly checking to see if anything's out of place and breaking down and rebuilding uh, to get towards a better understanding of the world. But then again, the world is moving, so you have to, you have to make your thought go as fast as the world if you want to keep up with it. Yeah, so if, if you look at the OODA loop, uh, this is why the, absur uh, sorry, the observe step is connected into the orient step and the act step is connected into the observe step, right? Uh, it's very like pragmatist in that sense, right? Mm -hmm. You get a fit with your, it, it, like once your actions feed back onto the world, you're kind of testing for the fit between your model and the world. Yes, it's very, it's, it, it is very like concurrently developing similar theories to Charles Peirce. Yes, then the suspicion section. Uh, Derek, what's this bit, what's this bit about? This is where the abduction comes in, right? Yeah, the suspicion is like this idea that you you have to be aware that your concepts uh, are necessarily incomplete and it contain um, at some point, I'm just going to quote verbatim here, ambiguities, uncertainties, anomalies are apparent inconsistencies which may emerge to stifle a more general and precise matchup of the concept with their realities. And we have to suspect this, not just admit that this is the case. So it's so the idea here is you should not just have this idea that, oh, it could be the case that there's going to be ambiguities or inconsistencies. No, no, no. Um, because of Heisenbergian uncertainty principle, um, I should assume at all times that um, – there's going to be ambiguities and inconsistencies which we're going to need to redirect. And thus, this is what this is the part that I thought rhymed with abduction. That, that you must be willing to be surprised that your model is not um, all explanatory. And, you know, um, so talking, I, I, this is the part to me that, like, where where at one sense, like, this, is com this has been common sense and... and, and and like planning and practical uh, applications in the 90s, um, but that uh, apply like leftists fundamentally don't believe this anymore. <laughs> so oh yeah, this this is like the the immortal science fucking mo nonsense, and like uh, yeah, <laughs> right, and yeah, like and, and the it violates these principles and therefore can't be scientific. Right in the, the eternal strategy, like uh, and all, all talks of like you know necessary outcomes and stuff. It's just like well that brackets out all ambiguities, all inconsistencies, all the fact that we know that the map and the terrain can't be the same thing. Like that's like that's a fundamental problem for for some of these people, and which is why people are constantly being fucking surprised, right? Like uh, leftists and or people in general, right, are endlessly fucking surprised by developments in the world. And it's like, okay, if you've got, if you, if you seem to have this huge, like, like well-worked out scientific model of the world, why is everything so fucking surprising? Well, it's, it's, it's that because we don't have that attitude, 
of a, of, of of fundamentally assuming incompleteness and a willingness to be surprised during sort of the procedure of events that we are shocked when we are surprised, right? Because it's like the surprise breaks through the model for a while and then you have to reassemble it again and, and, and build up the, the barriers to uh, uncertainty once again. Whereas Boyd is short-circuiting all of that by just assuming it up front, right? As assume you will be surprised, assume you will turn out to be wrong. And it's like, you're, you're untouchable. It's like, I'm, I'm, there's no way I could possibly ever be owned. I'm, I'm, I always just assume I'm going to be owned anyway. Right. I mean, it's, it's, it's actually fascinating from the standpoint of psychology, which is not something that Boyd's pulling as much from, interestingly. But, like, the, this, this creates a feedback check against your own... Um, Stability biases, survivor biases, heuristics of, who, of dampening cognitive dissonance. Because what this does, if you took it seriously and actually internalized it, it makes cognitive dissonance your friend as opposed to something that you're constantly fighting against. It does. It's a fuel that you can use. And I guess like I can kind of see how for some, I, I can see how some people are kind of sketched out a little bit by uh, the fact that like, the notion of like reality checks and stuff are often deployed in a kind of like conservative, cranky sort of mode. Like it's it's often a conservative rhetorical trick to say like reality check and that kind of stuff. But like if we're in any way serious about changing the world for the better, we need to be internalizing this kind of reality check model of like suspicion of our own ideas because we can't afford to cede that to the conservatives, you know? It's 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 kind of the way that a lot of the left and definitely almost all liberals have have taken um, any critique of um, organizational sclerosis as inherently conservative, um, um, and to me this is just a this is not just a way to like it's a way to make sure that a that you can't build a society and that you actually are you actually become more subject to stochastic forces. Um, and B, like, so you're not, you can't adapt and change to it. And B, like, you can't even admit that that's what's going on. Mm -hmm. So, double so like, it's a way to build something that, like, is hyper fragile. Um, but it's also fragile at being fragile. <laughs> you know, it's like a double loss. <laughs> yeah, it's like not even good at that. Like, <laughs> it's a shitty kind of fragility. It's, you know. It's the worst kind. It's like the male fragility of the dude bro, but, like, at a systemic level. <laughs> Yikes. So... Uh, Boyd will bring us through the three things, um, first being uh, Gödel's incompleteness theorem. Um, and basically, I guess for, for anyone that doesn't know it, like basically uh, Kurt Gödel blew a hole in mathematics and logical systems in the early 20th century by kind of proving that um, in a given logical system, or I guess a system of concepts, um, it can't be both complete and consistent. Basically, there, there's always a kind of, like, um, incompleteness to it. There, and by incompleteness, he means that there are true statements that can't be expressed and, like, worked out in the system. Um, and, yeah, this this just means that, like, no no map will ever be, big, uh, be accurate enough to actually cover the territory. Um, right. So, basically, some axioms in the system cannot be justified within the system itself. They have to be either just assumed or come from an, a, a different set of proofs. And it's actually amazing to me when I was rereading uh, research on Golto and watching videos to explain it to me, because I was like, I remember learning this in college, and like no one's talked about it in 10 years. Um, I feel like it's still a big deal. Let me go back and look at it, and then I was like, oh, this shit's really basic. This is like, an, like, like in a way, he proves it with, like, yes, there's complicated math involved, but his ultimate proof is like, this statement, yeah, it's like a logical paradox. This statement cannot be justified within this truth set without creating a paradox. Therefore... So the, the way I've um, seen it explained, it's, it's probably useful for the listeners, right? That like, if you, have a, if you have a system in which you can build a statement that says this statement is false, then the, the, the system is incomplete in that sense, that it, it, has, um, it has ambiguities, it has, it has like true expressions that it can't actually resolve. Um, and then you might think, oh, well, okay, let's just forbid self-reference so I can't use the word this to refer to this this sentence. But then you get around it by saying the following statement is false and then the previous statement is true. 
And, you know, so that's kind of some of what Girdle is doing, is just kind of demonstrating that there's always these kind of escape hatches through which you can kind of get to incompleteness and inconsistency. Right, so even Moda logic doesn't get you out of the problem. Uh, so if for, for listeners, uh, if you want more on this uh, and you're interested in the beer, uh, sorry, the brain of the firm reading group, uh, beer has a whole chapter on this problem uh, of meta languages addressing uh, lower level languages, um, which is pretty early on in uh, brain of the firm. And for, for Boyd, this all just means basically that like um, you're, con- you're, con- your conceptual model cannot be entirely consistent with itself, um, and it can't entirely be consistent with the world. Um, they are both necessarily incomplete. Um, and so, but even when we use observations to sharpen up the concepts, and then we use the concepts to sharpen our observations, we're still going around an incomplete loop, and we just have to accept, accept that. That's fine. Uh, indeterminacy and uncertainty, where he brings in Heisenberg and the indeterminacy principle, or uncertainty principle, I think is how it's, it's often referred to. Um... For the, I think for Heisenberg, this is kind of basically like if you observe something um, like a particle or some object, let's just say an object, you can either measure it, you can either measure its like position to an extreme degree of um, certainty, but you lose track of its uh, velocity, or you measure its velocity very accurately, but you, you lose track of its position. So you can't know both of those at the same time. Um, and it, it, in some sense, this is kind of like about the way the probe interacts with the um, with the object, right? So, like, if you're if you're me- measuring, you know, velocity, like, how do you measure velocity? You, do you like put something in front of the thing to like like a sensor to like stop it from moving? But then, if you if you interact with it in that way, you've actually slowed its velocity. So, you know, um, or like if something doesn't weigh very much and you want to weigh it, or or you want to get a, a sense for some of its internal properties, like the probe might actually destroy the thing you're measuring. Um, so anyway, it's you can't know both of these facts about the thing in perfect detail, um, and then for Boyd, this I guess this this section is a little bit tricky. But where it comes back to is that um, when the uh, so I'm, I'm just going to read read it out actually. Um, the quote: When the intended distinction between observer and observed begins to disappear, the uncertainty values hide or mask phenomena and or behavior. Or, put another way, the observer perceives uncertain or erratic behaviour that bounces all over in accordance with the indeterminacy relation. Under these circumstances, the uncertainty values represent the inability to determine the character or nature, the consistency of a system within itself. So this is, for Boyd, specifically about a system that's trying to measure itself. Like, Or if, if you are operating within a system of thought and trying to refine it using only its own parts then you kind of open yourself up to this huge indeterminacy because um, because of the relation between the probe and the probed. Um, just kind of fundamentally brings this uncertainty to bear. Uh, yeah, so this gets back to sort of like the core ideas of second order cybernetics, right? Um, uh, once the cybernetician is included in the system that's being observed, these kinds of problems uh, uh, appear. And it's a problem because the, the observer is a complex object observing a complex object. So, like, for for the Heisenberg stuff, like, a, a complex observer of a simple object is fine. But a complex observer of a complex object is going to be very, very uncertain. And that kind of goes doubly so if the complex object is you and you are observing yourself. Um, so there are hard limits to self-observation. There are, there are hard limits to operating inside of yourself uh, as a system. Um, because those those magnitudes of uncertainty just go through the roof. Um, but this but this is also like the basic truth of why social science, even if it was actually like, and I actually do defend social sciences as actual sciences, despite assertions to the contrary. That their complexity means that any any conclusion that you'd make from them has to be so tentative as to almost be useless. Um, and and I say that like as a believer that there is there is this thing as social science but this is why everyone's gold standard is physics because it, it is a complex thing observing the most simple fucking things in the universe <laughs> and that's infinitely complex feeling even but like imagine trying to use a particle accelerator to study a particle accelerator like it wouldn't work yeah exactly <laughs> the uncertainty would be way too high whereas you can use a particle accelerator to study or like you, you can use an electron microscope to study 
electrons, but you can't use it to study an electron microscope, you know, because it's, it's just the, the, the complexity mismatch is, is far too much. So this makes history a dismal science. <laughs> because it happens in real time, and it's complex. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And it's a complex observer, but watching infinitely more complex observers. Uh huh. <laughs> it's grim. The the problem here, like, is that in the 18th and 19th centuries, um, you know, we basically got so enthusiastic with uh, math and physics um, that we assumed this problem didn't exist uh, <laughs> anymore. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the Newton mechanical model of the universe and society. Like, we forget the and society part. Mm. Well, it's, it's why Gödel's uh, incompleteness theorem was such a fucking, like, a heartbreaker, because, like, you had Whitehead and these kind of guys trying to, like, formalize all of mathematics in one system. And this guy just comes in and fucking clowns them from out of nowhere and verifies that it can't be done and just breaks a lot of hearts, you know? Like, like set theory's over. <laughs> <laughs> it's done. Pack up and go home, folks, you know? It, it's like in um, in Hegel, you get a way of dealing with the Kantian antinomies, uh, but like incompleteness, like sabotages Hegel at an even more fundamental level than that. Right. Like there's already this idea of sort of negativity in Hegel and like you know, oppose things and all this kind of stuff and contradiction and, you know, all that kind of thing. But when you get to, you know, this really solid proof <laughs> that we get from Goodall, it really just like blows the whole thing up. Uh, this this whole project of um, understanding the world that that really gets going with Newton. Yeah. And isn't isn't it fucking astonishing that like almost for, for most socialists or most, most like strands of socialist thought just don't account for any of this stuff like no they they actually have actively gone backwards on this since the fall of the soviet union um where like we can we, you have badu trying to resurrect set theory just in basic not dealing with this fact you have um you have people uh, trying to resurrect Hegelianism as a, as a immortal science. But you know what they often do to make it seem more plausible is they don't, they, you know, even bracketing out how much religious stuff is in Hegel um, explicitly, frankly. Um, they also psychologize everything so it's no longer under the realm of uh, something you can prove with this proven material history. Um and so it seems immune to these sorts of claims, but that's like, the, you know, not to bring up something like, like the Sokol hoax, but that was really what that kind of exposed for me was just like, oh, so much of this theory is a way to not address some stuff from the past that fundamentally blows up assumptions um, that we just kind of have, that we have a, that we could have an all knowing singular science of human relations and this, that, or the other. Um, and, and I think, um, I mean, to use the parlance of the internet, I think a lot of this re re reversion back to older forms of, of logic or whatever as somehow superior forms is basically just a cope that, that, that also kind of is, is impotent making. Like you can't do anything with this stuff actually. Like, um, you know, but it's really good for solidifying your own knowledge. So, like, when I, when I approach this, I often don't mention these things directly, but I talk about their psychological effects. But fundamentally, like, like if, you're, if you're saying that we know from an event in 1917 exactly how to construct a socialist utopia now, um, when conditions are with, – with even, like, from a Marxist standpoint, almost all conditions of relation and production are different than in the USSR – then you you just aren't dealing with reality at all. You're, you're exempting yourself from any kind of reality check. Um, yeah. Well, like Boyd Boyd hits the nail on the head so well in this like, like back in the suspicion section where he he's kind of laying out like if like okay so we, we have to assume that we could be surprised by new data because if if we took the opposite we'd actually end up in a very vexing position where we are 
insisting that new observations couldn't possibly change the model. And that just doesn't smell right, does it? That's kind of what he's saying there. And yet we see this all the time. <laughs> Yeah, all the fucking time. And so Boyd, like that, that, that stuff hit me like a ton of bricks when Boyd was saying that kind of stuff. I was like, okay, well, like we have to have this suspicion and we have to have this iterative refinement of the model because the alternative is untenable. But then I was like, oh my fucking God, like that alternative, the unte untenable alternative is a pretty fucking large bulk of socialist and Marxist theory. Like, uh, <laughs> you know? Yeah, the... Um the the revival of abduction at the beginning of the 21st century um was a response to grounded theory which was itself a reaction to the problems of sort of applying an invariant marxist conceptual system to social uh science research um so, like, this is, like, directly related. <laughs> like, the revival of, 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 of abduction is, like, one step removed from that problem, right? Because the reaction was to go, we'll just do induction. And then it's like, well, yeah, but induction can't actually generate conceptual systems. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Brutal. Um, the uh, third justification for the suspicion is going to be entropy and the second law of thermodynamics. Um Ah, oh, it's good stuff. I love a bit of entropy. I love a good slice of entropy in the morning. Uh, se second, second law of thermodynamics just recently uh, violated in physics. Very interesting. Oh, interesting. Uh, uh, time crystals were developed by Google, which actually violate the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, not in the general sense, but in, in the, the sense. specific sense. Yeah, in the local sense. Because eventually you're going to run out of power to run the system, and then you, the, the, the second law will apply. But in that local system, the second law doesn't apply. Well, I guess it's a, it's a sort of neglected part of the second. I, does, the second law does specify that it, it can allow, or doesn't it? I don't know, that, that it can allow for local reversals? No, it does. It does. That's like, that's what, right. That's why, like, evolution happens and it's not totally degenerative as we have the sun giving us outside power. Yeah, it's just that the... The time crystal is reproducing exactly the same pattern of order uh, uh, across across time, and therefore it is breaking the second law. Uh, uh, Whoa, that's fascinating! But it requires an immense amount of power to do, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Yes, but yeah, go go read up on it, listeners. It's fun stuff. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to find a link for that for the show notes. Um, but again, for listeners who may maybe not totally familiar, entropy is this like. Okay, I'm gonna make a short post. I'm gonna like the stream is is gonna stay on. Um, I'm gonna be away for like two, three, five minutes or something, um, and uh, I'm gonna get pizza um, and some energy drink because we still want to do the discussion. I mean, it's like the the kind of a downside that these episodes are so fucking long. Like it's like half, like one out. Like it's like it's like hard stuff. And then two and like two more than two hours, like holy fucking shit. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna come back and we're gonna like continue listening and while I eat pizza. And uh, yeah, so gonna be right back. Um, I'm gonna play ads. Uh, give me a second, maybe I can put like the longest possible ad on. Yeah, three three minutes. Let's see if I'm, I'm back in three minutes. I'm gonna put play a three minute ad.
I'm back. Yo, Mushroom. Hi. So, I'm back. Um, pizza time. Pizza time. Yeah. So, let's listen to the remaining 45 minutes. <laughs> I have a bottle of Coke, a bottle of Red Bull. So that after these 45 minutes, if I'm still alive, Kim can come on and we can discuss the pot and yeah, some assume you also know what's going on then if you wanna if you if you want if you wanna you can come back for that if you want to. Uh, let's let's just let's just continue. Concept in physics and it, it comes up in information theory as well, but like um it's kind of inversely related to capacity for action. So in a high entropy scenario, you have very little capacity to, to act. And in a low entropy scenario, you have high capacity to act. Uh, it's also related to the degree of confusion or disorder. So if you imagine a teacup sitting on a table, that's a, um, a low entropy system. And if the teacup f uh, falls onto the ground and smashes, it goes into a high entropy state. Um, the general law is that entropy tends to just increase. Um, so, Teacups do spontaneously fall out, fall down and break, but they don't spontaneously reassemble themselves. Um, and that's actually related to the way we experience time. That um, in general, it, it, we experience time as having this arrow that moves in the direction of entropy increasing. Um, which means that in general, for natural processes, entropy and confusion and disorder increase uh, in a closed system, um, notably. So in, in an open system that's re receiving new energy and information, such as the Earth, this isn't the case for the Earth overall. But when the sun dies out and all stars die out and everything kind of cools to an approximately equal temperature, then, you know, entropy will be maximum. But for the moment things are structured, they will tend to become unstructured. Yeah, so just to put this in a very simple uh, example, uh, it's like, you know, uh, when you have ADHD and you go into hyper focus and you act in this incredibly uh, fast and focused way, uh, you crash immediately afterwards because your capacity for action has been depleted by going from a low entropy state to a very high entropy state uh, in a really quick amount of time. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'll read out the quote here from Boyd. Accordingly, whenever we attempt to do work or take action inside such a system, a concept and its matchup with reality, we should anticipate an increase in entropy, hence an increase in confusion and disorder. Naturally, this means we cannot determine the character or nature or consistency of such a system within itself, since the system is moving irreversibly towards a higher yet unknown state of confusion and disorder. So basically, like a closed self-referential system of concepts, or a, you know, any closed self-referential system, can only have this steadily increasing, increasing confusion um, and decreasing capacity for action. What does that remind you of, folks? You know, all the stuff we've been talking about. <laughs> a self-referential system that just has increasing confusion and decreasing capacity for action? Hmm. Mm. I wonder. Yeah, I, I like this because it actually... Um, it actually gets... By connecting this into incompleteness, it gets away from the Platonism that is often implied by incompleteness or the approach to incompleteness. Because, like, Gödel himself was a Platonist, right? Um, uh, so, so, like, you know, usually we'll think about this as, like, oh, yeah, there's, like, this math system out there in the world. And, like, it's, I don't know, it exists in a, a higher plate of thought or something. But if we actually, like, say, like, well, you can get to a similar kind of problematic by talking about something that's immensely or, like, just eminently physical, like thermodynamics, which really just comes initially out of heat dissipation, um, uh, then it's actually like a, an angle on the thing that doesn't sort of lead you towards 
the uh, idea that there's like a higher realm of thought that exists outside of time. And yeah. Yeah. The mathematics is not right. There's not this like platonic order outside of all time and dimensionality and we're just accessing it. Um, it brings you towards computationalism, right? Where, um, so like in, in the platonic sort of notion, like you can ask a question like, what is the last digit of pi? And that makes sense there. But if you move to more like a Turing kind of model of computation, like as in material computation, um, that's, it's a senseless question because if, if you start to calculate the numbers of the digits of pi, by definition, the final digit of pi is the last one you see before the sun burns out because it's a, it's a physical process. Computation is a physical process and it's not a kind of ethereal abstract kind of thing like, like mathematics was framed as. Um, so all, all these are definitely related, yeah. It, it's interesting, um, when I finally grokked at this uh, about 10 years ago, it was actually through a David Foster Wallace text on the history of infinity. Um, and we were talking about like the difference between the platonic conception and the computational conception of infinities and how you can have infinities with infinities with infinities. And from a platonic conception, that'll drive you insane. But from a computational conception, it's like, well, yeah, but that's just because you can do this infinitely in any set of infinite sets. So you, since you don't have infinite time, it's kind of a null question. Like, yeah, and, and like you can, you can do it while, you, like to tie it into thermodynamics, you can do that computation while you have a heat engine on your side. But once the room warms up to the same temperature as the CPU, all possibility for computation ceases. And that, thus the, the infinite calculation just stops and that's it so it's I, I find that i find that fascinating i've also found this i find this interesting in um something that i've been rereading um which is uh which i don't which is based off some of these theories which is uh um joseph tainter's uh the rising collapse of, of complex societies um which talks about entropy and complexity theory that social systems tend to gener to generate complexity and the complexity requires more and more energy to sustain, that energy dissipates in the confusion and the social systems become highly inoperable um, off of this. Uh, but he actually, uh, Tainter actually doesn't think this is totally inevitable, um, that like there is a way in which if you, if you factor that into your system and you start having, um, if you start creating more and more creative destruction, um, to use a terrible capitalist term, but is actually useful here. Um, you are freeing up you, you by by actually enacting controlled disorder. You are actually lessening confusion and freeing up resources to reinvest back into the energy system of the social of the social network. Um, and that seems to be kind of what Boyd is doing in battle. That's why it's so interesting to me that all these ideas were like coming out of like para academia in the eighties and nineties. And then we kind of drop them. Um, yeah, certainly. That is definitely what he's getting to here with this. Like, um, I'm just, I'm going to read out the paragraph. Uh, what an interesting outcome. According to Gödel, we cannot in general determine the consistency, hence the character or nature of an abstract system within itself. According to Heisenberg and the second law of thermodynamics, any attempt to do so in the real world will expose uncertainty and generate disorder. Taken together, these three notions support the idea that an inwardly oriented and continued effort to improve the matchup of concept and observed reality will only increase the degree of mismatch. Um, but then he does go on to say that doesn't need to be the case because we can do this dialectical process of destructuring and restructuring to re-inject new fresh energy and fresh information into the system. So it doesn't need to degenerate. I mean, there really is a way in which both the Remer and and uh, and the thesis on Fourier actually come into play here, um, um, whereas like we are subject to these natural processes. If we understand the natural processes, we can manipulate them in ways that would benefit us. But we have to admit that they're there. And but what's interesting is some of these natural processes seem to. At the one time, Marx is like intuiting this, and at the other time, the entire system of Marxism that we've accumulated goes in the opposite direction. And like for Boyd, the, the answer is to turn outwards. As well as doing this creative destructive process of reshaping the system, you have to turn outwards and be radically sensitive to the environment and to changing conditions, which is what historical Marxism is not very good at, right? Marx originally is quite good at it, but you know the, the tradition we've inherited is fucking terrible at this stuff. Um, and ironically, this is what leads Boyd to read Marxists. 
It's very funny. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, I mean, it is true, and, and Marx, Marxists were actually very flexible on this point until we had states to defend. Well, yeah, yeah, like he's he's reading Marxists who are who are writing in an insurrectionary moment, yeah, right, as opposed to Marxists in their state building or institution building moment, which is are are when they be, or where Marxism becomes an academic hobby of of certain humanities fields in the seventies, like like he, he would have no interest in that. Um. Yeah, there's there's like some ways in which his work kind of like rhymes with post-structuralism, but like you don't really need to read post-structuralist to get there, as we've kind of been talking about, right? Yeah, yeah. It's it's interesting. Yeah, it's interesting how much actually post-structuralism, if, if we look at these kind of traditions, does seem to emerge out of something real, but its its eventual answers and codifications go into La La Land. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's it's trapped in that swamp of like French, French academia and its own like class interests and that, that just sort of the uh, the drive to obscurity and that sort of stuff. But like, I mean, the often the core concepts are really good and compelling and are good answers to previous problems. But like, it's just wrapped up in thousands of pages of fucking horseshit, you know. If only none of them have read Heidegger. <laughs> um. Anyway, uh, I mean, it is interesting how how. Also, it proves that most of these points we could actually state clearly. Because I think you can give this to a person with a high school education, and they could they could derive something pretty clearly out of this. Whereas, like, if I gave like Deleuze Guattari to a person <laughs> with a high school education, which I have done, um, <laughs> it might be trying to do Platonist witchery or something within a few weeks. I have no idea. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So uh, Boyd's quote here is. Uh, we find that the uncertainty and disorder generated by an inward-oriented system talking to itself can be offset by going outside and creating a new system. Simply stated, uncertainty and related disorder can be diminished by the direct artifice of creating a higher and broader, more general concept to represent reality. Take that, Leninists. <laughs> yeah, take that. And I mean, ironically, this is like, this is what Marxist revolution is supposed to be. It's supposed to. Right. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we must remember the function of a thing is what it does. So. Uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> It's remarkable that like Boyd can identify this like dialectic engine, right? And he's drawing on on Marx and and like Marxists, but like it's also so evident that like historical Marxism had lost any of this kind of dynamism and was nowhere near as dialectical as it thought it was. <laughs> like uh. Yeah, I mean it's funny because like in the Russian Revolution what Lenin was trying to do was to do this to Marxism in in the, in the evident, in, in the face of like the disaster of World War 1. But it really didn't, like, he didn't go about it very well, is the problem. No, he actually built the, an even more rigid, constru- like, like we start longing for the for the uncertainty and ambiguousness about the future of the Second International and Karkowski, and I'm like, oh god, that something's gone horribly wrong if that's our point for flexibility, because they handled War I so well. <laughs> hmm. So, like, the dialectic engine got one kick and turned over one, one like, cycle, but then just stopped, right? Like, there was, there was one attempt to do this with Marxism, and then just, no, 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 fuck this, we're, we're static from now on. Well, I mean, it seems to happen every time that Marxists are in a... I don't want to sound like a Nicholas Talib, but, like, when Marxists are actually invested in an actual fight and their literal survival is on the line, then, yes, they start actually doing some of this stuff. But as soon as they feel like they've established power, almost cynically, they go back to an internal system. And they, they I mean, like, if you look at the USSR, you want to talk about something that was so internally, like, so highly teleologically centralized and oriented that it couldn't do anything but increase entropy. Like, I almost think, like, that... that that factor is something that people don't want to talk about in the USSR because they don't, as much as they want to talk about, more, you know, immortal science or whatever, they don't want to look at actual science and what it would implicate for that self, that enclosed of a system. Like, the, the, yeah, any kind of autarky is going to necessarily collapse. Like, that's what it does in all systems in nature, <laughs> Well, there's a dreadful irony in that, like, autarky and, like, this kind of, like, strong state, yada, yada, strong leader sort of thing is usually proposed, like, or it's usually justified as uh, as it being a good way to survive. 
like, oh, this, we, we need a strong leader because it's actually a strong system. This is how we stabilize things, yada, yada. But like, as we've, we've seen all throughout the run of the show, like the stuff we've been reading and like this stuff here, like what you end up with there is just an engine that's choking on its own fumes and is destined to collapse. And there's, there's a dreadful irony in like something that is fundamentally and structurally unsound being used as a justification for soundness or like sound, apparent soundness being used as a justification for it. Um, it's, it, it's no wonder we're fucking swimming in crises constantly, right? Right. Well, I mean, it's interesting because this actually comes up in Tainer. Tainer talks about how there is an innate appeal um, in over-complex systems because of their anthropic nature to want to appeal to a dictator to come in and just break the systems apart. But what that, yeah, but what that usually does is accelerate decline even further because it also gets rid of it doesn't it doesn't just break up and free the energy it literally destroys like all these things and centralizes it further into one person and when that person's gone you don't have anything you know because uh, a human body is an anthropic system it eventually falls apart so like <laughs> sorry cyber linen. Um, okay, so so when he gets to his uh, his 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 most Hegelian, uh, he says uh, the process of structure, unstructure, restructure, unstructure, restructure is repeated endlessly in moving to higher and broader levels of elaboration. I believe we have uncovered a dialectic engine that permits the construction of decision models needed by an individual and societies for determining monitoring actions in the effort to improve their capacity for independent action. Like, that's, like, more Hegel than Hegel, you know? <laughs> yes, and uh, the this this point about independent action, capacity for independent action, is important for uh, Boyd because we kind of skipped over it, but he sees it as the fundamental aim of humanity. Like, this is the core of human nature. Is individual liberty. Yes, individual... Yes, 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 exactly. And, and not not just abstract, not just abstract liberty, but like literally capacity for independent action. Well, it's a little like the functional and uh, collective autonomy that we saw in the Thomas Swan book, right? It, it, it can be sort of read that way. I don't think that's what Boyd is doing, but... Uh, yeah, well, well again, like the, the, the thing is that he sees this as like the actual fundament of all human behavior. Um, right. Whereas... He does think that basically all human behavior is a proxy or actually literally is war. Like... Yes. Uh, he's... Yeah, I think he's... I think he's too liberal to be a Nietzschean, but he's kind of in that neighborhood-ish. His, his Hobbesianism also kind of shows up there with, like... Okay, individuals want to maximize their um, their autonomy, and therefore they get together in in groups and operate together to do that. It's, it's yeah. a very social contract. It's very social contract angle sort of thing. But I guess like when I was reading this, it was like it's not his. his some of what he's expressing is not entirely incompatible with like the the functional autonomy stuff. But his angle on it is very different, you know. Oh no, that's true. It, it it's it's the assumption that that is the absolute fundament of human behavior whereas like somebody somebody like beer would assume that we have a nature that can flourish and our our fundamental aim is towards flourishing which is not at all assumed by boyd right which would not necessarily like for individual flourishing would not necessarily be totally dependent on individual uh autonomy of movement like um which is it's a subtle distinction, actually, but it's kind of a big one. It is. It is. Yeah. There's there's sort of like more implied in the Aristotelian assumptions than there is in the Boydian ones. Uh, it's it's also open ended, right? With the Eudaimonian flourishing stuff, um, that you could you could learn to flourish in different ways that are not foreseen initially. Right. It's just like how it's it's like Aristotelian virtue models. If you if you don't assume that Aristotelian Uh, Aristotle had the precise virtue ratios right, then then you have like infinite virtues and strengths that you can model in infinitely different ways, um, 
or you can limit it by something arbitrary like Athenian society or uh, Christianity or whatever. But but the initial impulse is still redeemable from Aristotle. I mean, it's it's uh, I think that eudaimonia is also like that. Like human flourishing is is a is a concept that contains multiple um, vectors, whereas human autonomy contains one. Mm, yeah, true. Certainly. Uh, basically, it's like if there would be nothing like if, let's say, Jeff Bezos were able to completely subjugate uh, humanity and just exist in, a, in a, an autonomous sense on another planet, um, there would n- be nothing in what he was doing that would be contrary to his nature in a Boydian sense. According, yeah. So basically, Doctor Manhattan would be the ultimate Bordian character. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which is which is where like he's kind of a Nietzschean, but also like he's 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 really more of a Hobbesian. Yeah. Yeah. So I think there's something um, good in like con- just continuing on the quote there. So furthermore, since this engine is directed towards satisfying this basic aim or goal, it follows that the goal-seeking effort itself appears to be the other side of a control mechanism that seems also to drive and regulate the alternating cycle of destruction and creation toward higher and broader levels of elaboration. In this context, when acting within a rigid and or essentially a closed system, the goal-seeking effort of individuals and societies to improve their capacity for independent action tends to produce disorder towards randomness and death. On the other hand, as already shown, the increasing disorder generated by the increasing mismatch of the system concept with observed reality opens or unstructures the system. As the unstructuring, or as we call it, the destructive deduction unfolds, it shifts toward a creative induction to stop the trend towards disorder and chaos to satisfy a goal-oriented need for increased order. Paradoxically, then, an entropy increase permits both the destruction or unstructuring of a closed system and the creation of a new system to nullify the march toward randomness and death. So there's a there's this kind of bright light there. There's a it's it, that actually, um, you know, we can we can it, we, we certainly experience the in, increase in chaos as traumatic, but it if if we if we think that the system is maybe operating on this higher level, it could be just one leg of a an alternating process that the destructuring and chaos is fertile ground for restructuring and for rejuvenation. But you have to be aware of it, like to, to take advantage of it. Yes. And it, it, this is basically like Hegelian reconciliation. Um, like when you have the synthesis, it's like you've gone through this traumatic destabilization, but like actually you re- re- you, you get a new conceptual system, so you're able to reframe your experience. Um, but uh, I think that the key things here is that to simply go for Landian accelerationism is just the entropic drive to destruction, right? Right. So, so like, yeah. So either if you're Paul Varillo, who's afraid of that, because I keep on thinking about Land and Varillo when I was reading this, um, uh, Varillo is totally afraid of that, which is like a leftist conservatism where you just become afraid of speed. And then, then there is the Landian accelerationism that would be just a drive for destruction for its own sake, like, like in, in the jouissance of chaos. Like, oh, there's all these possible fecundity of life, but ignoring the fact that, like, you know, um, even ev- like when I talk about like evolution, I'm always like, remember that evolution is 99.9 percent anthropic death, like. <laughs> uh and i think the the other thing there is that like you're sort of getting at this leftist conservatism Dirk, and i think that's the thing that comes up for me a lot is that like when i read boyd it seems to be that like a lot of this stuff doesn't appeal on the left because leftist conservatism is the default like dominant ideology on the left uh Right, because because leftists don't separate between conservative temperament and then what they think to be the substance of ideologies. And so to constantly see yourself as a victim and to constantly see yourself as stress is actually a conservatizing force. Um, and, and also to like basically go through the 20th century, have the construction of like a Lasallian welfare state 
and then be entirely invested in its preservation and extension um, is is a conservative position. And to see yourself besieged by chaos on all sides and that like that kind of desperate retrenchment, yeah, it's, it's extremely conservative. Right. I mean, and you see that also in the like, and this is across the board in the left, like the defenses of of uh, Zhidong China. Um, is is effectively if you like look at for example the quote red uh, the red new deal new regulations it's effectively like celebrating China for doing what the capitalist countries said they might do in the thirties I mean like like and so like you, your vanguard of the socialist revolution is literally just trying to do what was attempted in the West in in the thirties forties fifties sixties like that's that's it. So that, how, how is that not a conservative position? And that's on the most, and to me that kind of still is like one of the least conservative parts of it. When you get into like defending FDR as like the, the focal point of revolutionary Marxism or defending the Canadian welfare state or defending um, even the National Health Service. And, and it's, it's just like, but... You're not you're not injecting anything new into this. You're just defending a scrolotic system, and it's easy for these neoliberals to take advantage of that. Like, um, it's 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 also like one of the big problems with uh, like sustainability initiatives, where um, they can only be admitted insofar as they are an extension of the existing system. Like, and that's not simply capitalist market dynamics. It's also the form of bureaucracy that is dominant uh, in the world right now. Right. It's about to say, not, not everything is capitalism. Some of these systems problems are more fundamental than that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's also like something that I found, it was kind of after the January 6th stuff that has really started to strike me, right? That like, um... I, I sort of start to wonder if, like, that kind of left conservatism is just going to be the dominant strand and that kind of, like, anti-system leftism is just going to be impossible because, like, we, we, we live amongst a kind of system that is in continuous collapse and is evidently not fit for purpose for the governance of human life and so on and so forth, right? But if... I, 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 could, see our, I could see politics kind of getting, getting into a place where the only people who are like moving against the system are all moving from the right against it. And the left, the, the like anarcho Bidenist pact kind of double down on just defending whatever threadbare bullshit is left in the kind of like wreckage of the welfare state. Well, this is the rational core of the PMC thesis. Like, and I don't agree with the PMC thesis, but there is a sense in which because of the chaos and trying to defend these, these things. And, and, but in the United States, I don't even really know what they're defending anymore because we're not getting even the reforms they were promised. And um, every condition that, that, that they're concerned about is actually getting worse. But um, there's, a def there's an idea that, well, since, since our enemies are embracing the chaos of the situation, we have to go in defensive mode against the system. We have to defend Gavin Newsom. We have to defend... Um, AOC, we have to defend Biden because the alternative is worse. Um, well, I hate to tell you that that is a you're dead. You're dead in the water. It actually, it actually, um, in, in a way that I would take from a Boyd synthesis, it's like it's a Weimar situation where you, you're literally ceding action only to your opposition. They're the only people now capable of action, so they will win. Like. <laughs> Um, and if you like, we're going to get into this later in the chapter, but Boyd talks about Blitzkrieg and counter Blitzkrieg and the successful counter Blitzkrieg strategy, which is the, the, the strategy the Soviets used once they got their shit together in, in the second world war, um, uh, is, is not to sit and wait or to defend strong points. It's actually yeah. That's what they were trying to do, and that's what led to the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact. <laughs> yeah, and 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 then the actual successful strategy is to have the better OODA loop than your opponent. You out Blitzkrieg the Blitzkriegers to to be better at Blitzkrieging. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It literally counter Blitz. You know, like you shatter you shatter their coordination before they shatter yours. You know, uh, but that, none of that is evident in the left in, like, the UK or the US, not, like, fucking zero. And, like, I, yeah, again, like, when the January 6th stuff, and I was like, 
oh my god, they're all just going to go in on, like, defending the honour of the fucking Capitol building. And, like, when you had ostensible fucking Marxists ca calling for the the MAGA dipshits to be executed in front of the fucking Washington Monument or whatever, and it's like, Jesus goddamn Christ, like, they're just going to go in and defend the existing system as as absolutely fucked as it is. Like, it's it's going to morph into this thing that just defends whatever happens to exist, you know? Right. But they were doing it in the context of literally processing it minutes ago. That's, I think that's when, I think a lot of people lost, I, I, what people don't realize also is like, um, that's also discrediting. Like for all the people talking about the vitality of, of, the, of the George Floyd uh, insurrections, and I, I do believe there's real vitality there. I'm not shitting on it. Um, the, uh, the way the left handled the counter response, which was not to, you know, try to outdo, um, which by the way, have been the successful strategy as much as I think, uh, Antifa strategy and Antifa popular frontism has been a large waste of time. Um, the one time it did matter, which was Charlottesville, how was it successful? Well, somebody died, but also they counter mobilized basically doing the same thing as their opponents. Um, and that's not what's been learned from any of this. I, I think this also gets to sort of what we were talking about in the last episode where um, this is kind of the dead end that the Occupy to electoralism uh, path ran into uh, and like why the social democracies of Europe, like the de social democratic parties of Europe – were so decimated by the 2007, 2008 crisis uh, was because like they were stuck in these purely defensive positions and like didn't actually have that uh, uh, capacity for independent action. Right. Like they were, they were just moribund uh, in the face of crisis. Mm hmm. The, the capacity for independent action thing really reminds me of, like, um, uh, I think it's a sort of, like, I guess fringe kind of, like, theory for, like, what exactly constitutes intelligence. Um, and it's the, the notion that, like, intelligence basically correlates to causal entropy. I think it's a sort of weird bullshit word the folks made up for it. But basically that, like, an intelligence system will try to maximize or optimize the number of possible actions it has in its future. Um, so like it'll, you find a high point from which to, to look because you have the, you know, largest number of possible egresses and that kind of stuff. Right. And that's, and I think that kind of correlates with the capacity for independent action, right? That like an intelligent self-organizing system will optimize itself to have a wide array of options available to itself and to have all of those options be actually good. And again, no, none of that I see in in the contemporary left, like the fucking DSA momentum, none of these fucking people exhibit any of that kind of stuff. Like it, it would be hard to classify it as having independent action, having intelligence, having strategy, having organization, having any of this stuff we've been we've been talking about. Yeah, I think the the, the counterpoint there is the the point about variety attenuation that like you don't actually want to maximize, but you want to find yeah you want to optimize it in terms of what you can actually handle. Uh, but, you know, yeah, just going back to that point about electoralism, it's like you had, say, like the French, uh, social Democrats or the Germans or what, or the, the, the Greeks or whatever. And like, you know, people rightly analyzed the situation, what was, what was happening after the crisis. And we're saying, well, you're not living up to the ideals and goals that you are supposed to stand by. We're going to put somebody else in power who can or who is willing to actually enact our ideals. Um, and so then you have like, you know, that kind of like uh, movement of the squares and all that kind of stuff that happens. Right. And, and it gets channeled into electoralism. And then once it's into the electoral system, it's the same dead end. The problem, the problem space hasn't really changed at all. In fact, if anything, what you've done is actually in inculcated your enemy um, uh, with more energy, 
which is I've been kind of like trying to, to get when I say stuff like, you know, the, the left has functionally saved the center in the United States. It's because actually you have you have propelled the movement of momentum because you only respond to counterforce. You're literally only in a reactionary mode in the in the strict sense of that, not in the I'm not saying that in the substantive ideological sense, but in the you are reacting. That's all you're doing. Well, like, yeah. Absolutely. Like, if you look at the um, the whole thing from, if you look at the whole, say, DSA versus Democrats sort of thing, but look at it from the Democrats angle, like the D- the DNC angle, like, that's a fairly well-tuned machine that then digests the DSA and uses that as a source of new energy and new information and uses that to revive itself in, in a kind of Boydian way, you know? You know? Right, the dirty split strategy and all this in this weird Bordian way would would actually only work if you use it to disrupt the Democrats. But that's the exact thing that they don't want to do because they feel like they're in the, the, a defensive mechanism to save the gains of the Democrats. And 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 structurally speaking, and I've been telling people to study game theory for this for a long time. That's a losing game. There's no way to win that game. Well, it's a, it's a winning game from the DNC's perspective because they can use the DSA and that kind of stuff as a, as a food source, essentially. Like, it's a counter-entropy pump, you know? Right, it's a new way to get, to get uh, activists invested into the, into the DNC to, to screen for talent from outside of traditional DNC sources. Um, but it also, and, and it, it actually is a controlled opposition. Like, it, in the quite literal sense. Like... And, and, um... I think the the thing that always pisses me off around election time is that people are extremely uh, energized to push everyone around them into activism for whatever left party is in power or has a prospect of being in power, whatever, you know, whatever the lesser evil is of the day. Um, And the thing that I... I don't people at least think of in the same way that I do is that like you're actually expending energy and increasing your entropy in order to make that happen. Like this isn't free. Like that's why I get so angry at social Democrats or Democrats in the U S who lecture activists about how like like as though this is free because it's free for them (laughs) but it's not free for us (laughs) i kind of just want motherfuckers to think about cost even if even if just in brute like caloric terms like like if you spend your day going canvassing for the democrats you can't spend the same day doing something else it's really basic kind of shit yeah yeah it's an opportunity cost loss like yeah like like when i work for the ndp here uh campaigning and they were running a disastrous campaign and they got absolutely hammered and then proceeded to learn absolutely nothing from that that felt like a really fundamental violation of my trust because i put the energy into campaigning doing things like avoiding things that i could otherwise be doing for that party and they just take that as gratis and carry on in the same disastrous direction. It's like, well, that's not a two-way street in any way. And like, I cannot come away from that and have any self-respect if I'm just going to do the same thing again. They're using you as a food source. You're, you're chewing their food for them. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> like what? Come on. Which, 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 which is funny because when I talk about this in regards to like the DSA and why I won't join... Um, and I'm like, because as long as you have an unclear stance on your uh, relationship to the Democrats, you're always going to actually be serving them. And I, as a side note, th- I got I, that was done to me once. I wasted a whole lot of time for both uh, Mike Gravel and then Barack Obama. Um, I don't make the same mistake twice. Like, yeah, you learn from you learn from your mistakes. It's, 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 that's like that's all I I expect to do for myself and other people to do, but everybody around me, like not everybody, but many people around me look at me like I'm crazy because I had a bad experience and I've tried to learn from it. I totally understand your, what you're saying there. Like, is it's, it's like, 
I don't know. It's it's really fucking weird because like I like if if an organism isn't going to learn from its past experiences and like integrate new behavior, what the fuck is it doing? But then it's dying. Is what it's doing. Apparently, I'm the apparently I'm the crazy one for thinking that, and apparently the three of us are crazy for thinking that. Are we totally fucking alone in thinking this? I you know. No, but but weirdly, I hate to say this. It's actually like. Centrists talk about this stuff more than we do. Like, if you listen to, like, like uh, Vox or even, like, Heterodox Academy or whatever, they talk about these psychological and anthropic principles and stuff way more than we do. We talk about ideological principles and mystifications. Part of that, I think, is that if we are honest, um, we have a conservative position because a lot of people involved in our uh, their orientation – is actually trying to replicate a standard of life that they were promised under capitalism through some kind of socialist means. That's why they focus on things like free university, healthcare, which I'm not against. The healthcare thing I can totally defend, but like, um, because that does affect everybody. But but free university, and, and they don't even look at this, that they would have trade-offs in either... Uh, what what happens in normal cases with free university, and we have this in plenty of countries to study from, right, is you have elite capture of then a free resources, not because it's free, but because it's prestigious, because it's elite and scarce, because they can because the state only invests so much into it. And if the state invests a lot into it, the commodity produced, i.e. the credentialization, becomes not useful, which is what we already see with high school everywhere on earth. Um, so it's like... These, this, this is not a dynamic way of viewing the world because it's also not taking in these, these new changes, new factors, or even basic principles. It's, op- it's operating off of static axioms. Yeah, and to rhyme with something I think you said just a moment ago, like it's, it, it's a quite, quite a, dis- it's a disappointing realization to realize that for a lot of ostensible communists, like re- they really don't have any intention of bringing about a stateless, classless society. It's all really just a backstop for the fact that the economy didn't deliver on the stuff they were promised when they were growing up, you know? And so well, if, if, if my job isn't going to give me, or, or you know, if, if my economic situation isn't going to give me education and entertainment well, or, or whatever and housing, well, I'm going to, we're just going to backstop to something that would. And it's like, it, but that's, it's a defensive, conservative kind of retreat, not like an active thrust toward achieving the thing that you want. There's a real fundamental mix-up at the heart of so much of this. And unfortunately, reading cybernetic theory, even reading conflict theory, I mean, you have to take... One thing I tell people is if you believe that society is class conflict, you have to take war theory pretty seriously. Otherwise, you're just like, you know, it it is really... It's it's not even LARPing. It's massive online RPG. Like... Like, LARPing would imply actual tactical experience and action that could be learned from it. But that would go, I'd have to go outside. I'm not going to fucking do that. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. Um, and when you read something like this, I mean, it's easy to get mad, mad at the left, um, but it, it really does seem like a fundamental failure of, of like, basic understanding of, of, like, energy dynamics and basic social networks and... You know, like just a refusal to engage. It's like not just a refusal to engage with the political essence of the 20th century. It's like a refusal to engage with the science of the 20th century. Mm-hmm. Like, I like I. I think a couple of months ago, or maybe a year ago, I posted what what I at the time thought was a troll comment in the Emancipation Discord, saying that most left, almost all like socialists would be better off reading about statistical mechanics rather than Lenin. And I, in reflect, in retrospect, I, that really wasn't a troll in, at all in the slightest. You should read, you should read about thermodynamics before you touch any of that other shit. <laughs> you know, you should know basic statistics and basic math before you deal with Lenin. I'm not saying not deal with Lenin, but you got to be able to judge it against something other than its own assertion. Yeah, yeah. Well, again, closed system, right? Closed system of thought, like self-referential uh, entropy spiral. Um, well, I think I think next time we're going to get into this a lot more because we'll be getting into like a lot of Boyd's um, sort of thinking about strategy, thinking about structure, thinking about strategic prescriptions, thinking about what's necessary to win conflicts. Um, and uh, we will see the many ways <laughs> in which this uh, pl- applies to our current situation. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, maybe, maybe I'll just read the final 
uh, block quote here, uh, and we'll wrap it up. Uh, so, uh, Boyd writes, taken together, the entropy notion associated with the second law of thermodynamics and the basic goal of individuals and societies seem to work in dialectical harmony, driving and regulating the destructive creative or deductive inductive action that we have described herein as a dialectic engine. The result is a changing and expanding universe of mental concepts uh, matched to a changing and expanding universe of observed reality. As indicated earlier, these mental concepts are employed as decision models by individuals and societies for determining and monitoring actions needed to cope with their environment or to improve their capacity for independent action. And so that's Boyd's explanation of how we get the uh, orient phase of the OODA loop um, right there. Fun. Um, yeah, it's, this, this has been a really incredible read, and I'm looking forward to getting to the next part of the chapter um, in our next next session, because we've, we've been recording for a while. Um, Derek, thanks for coming along with this. This, this is a really incredible discussion. Um, do you have anything uh, you'd like to plug, anything you'd like to tell people about before we go? Yeah, um, first off, read more systems theory. Um, I would actually suggest people read the depressing but not as hopeless book as it sounds, uh, The Rise and the Collapse of Complex Civilization by Joseph Tainer from 1988, because um, it's an archaeologist's take on this. Um, uh, and it's been very much picked up by people who study ecology. Um, you can check out Varm Blog, where I'm increasingly talking about this stuff as a uh, the turn away from me complaining about why the DSA sucks um, to like, well, let's talk about the deeper reason why and what you could possibly do about it. Um, uh, and uh, check out Mortal Science, where we talk about why uh, leftism has failed to live up to its promise to be anything like even approaching a science, um, which is, you know, the, the, the whole purpose of that podcast. Um, and uh yeah, um, that would be where to find me. Um, I do warn people, though, it's not introductory material. It is not a Communist 101 podcast. Thank you for listening to General Intellect Unit. Until next time, you can catch us on Twitter at GIUnitPod, and you can find us on the web at generalintellectunit.net. If you go to patreon.com slash generalintellectunit and throw us a couple of bucks a month, you can help us to keep the lights on and get access to our community Discord. This show is part of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast network and research collective. Go to emancipation.network and check out our sister shows such as From Alpha to Omega, Swamp Site Chats, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science, and Varen Vlog. They are all excellent shows and excellent folks. Once again, thanks for listening and we hope you enjoyed the show. Okay, um, I think I should turn on the heating a little bit, or should I? Yeah, a little bit maybe. And um, Kim, do you want to jump into a Discord call and we can check out? I will have to check out the um, volume of like if our voices are like somewhat aligned on stream. Okay, and then you can tell me like about smugness and shit. Let me turn on the heating a little bit and then we can jump in and everything and yeah.
Okay, so. Let me get things set up. All right. Um, yes, hi, people. Um, da -dum. And I'm gonna I'm gonna call you. Uh, do we want to do um, do we want to do with face cam or what do you prefer right now, like with or without face cam? Like I can do both. Okay. Then I think. Give me a second. I think I need to disable the cam in yes i need to disable the cam in obs then i need to call you and oh my god i have no idea if the yes yo 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 um give me a second the dim and i just have to do it my it, cam's not on it, yet, is it? Uh, no, it's not. But you're... Oh, that's weird. Because I have it on. Hold on. Let me just try... Okay. Just, uh, let me try turning that on again. Your... Uh, the weird feedback is, is back again. I have oh, no... Oh, is your, is, your, is your phone again? Just move my phone. Is that better? Okay. Say How's something that again? Sounding? How's that? How's that? It's, it's still a little bit there. It's like... As if like... It's like, like a beer. Like a bear. Like... It it does like a little bit. Um, what about that? Still a little bit. I don't know what's wrong, man. Any better? Is that any better? No, can you can you maybe I'm sorry that we have to do the um, can you yeah, maybe go okay. into the Windows sound uh, like um, um, the Windows device manager and um, there you can go into your mic and there you can like that's the only th uh, place where you can uh, like set up your mic gain I think in Windows internally like Windows device manager microphone like sound microphones and there you should find your microphone and there should be like an option to set your gain and maybe you can turn your gain a little bit down i don't know if that's if that's helping or something if that might help that's the only thing i could think about Hold on. Okay, so um, your cam is yeah now. Yeah, I don't know why my cam's not working for some reason. I think maybe I need to restart, the, rejoin the call. Yeah. Okay. So Let's now, now the feedback is is gone. What did you oh, change? Okay. I didn't do anything. What the fuck? What? what yeah, uh, I don't know, bro. What the fuck is going? Let, okay. let me just rejoin the call. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I can also start a new call if you. Okay. <laughs> huh? I don't know if he hears me. And all right, yo, now the feedback is 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 th back there. What the back? fuck is? Hold yeah, on, hold on, bro. What the? F what is going? On? What is going on with your with your mic, man? Uh, hold on. <laughs> I don't know what's happening. That's kind of weird. Okay. Um. Can you try the steps that I, that I told you with the going into the yeah, windows? Yeah. Yeah. That, that I, I couldn't find an option to do anything when I did that. Okay. Give me one second. Um. I think it's um. Yes, it's device manager. 
And there you have like um, audio inputs and outputs. And there you should have your microphone, like device manager. Oh, okay, I see, I see, hold and on. Yes, audio inputs and outputs and Okay. Yeah, so yeah. I see my microphone there. Now what do yes. I do? Yes. Now you right click on properties and what the fuck? Why? Okay, that's that's weird. Like uh do you is there like a uh an option where you can like like a tab where you can um uh like set a gain or something? No. Okay, that's weird. I, then I don't know what the fuck. Um like that. It's oh, hold, hold on a sec. Wait a sec. Wait a sec. Yeah. How's that? What is that better? It's better. What did you What did you do? What did you do? I was. It was going through my webcam. All the fucking time. Yeah, man. Oh, you never used your fucking real microphone. I Why? Is... To, I, I think. Um. I think I have set it to that, but something must have reset it in Discord at some point. <laughs> what the? F <laughs> How's that sounding? Is that better? <laughs> Bro, you. Your mic sounds so much fucking better. <laughs> That's really funny. Oh well, unlucky. <laughs> Who the fuck uses their webcam mic, man? <laughs> I mean, I fuck, man. Look, okay, boomer <laughs> moment. Just let's move on. <laughs> okay, let me let me check the the audio levels a little bit. If we are like somewhat okay. Um. Okay. Um. I'm gonna say something like test line, test line, normal, normal, normal. Now you? Uh, one, two, three. How does that sound? Yeah. One, two, three. John Boyd's a G. We're good. Apologies okay, to I all the viewers. I just, yeah, yeah, who's even viewing, man? Like, seriously, yeah. like, like, let's be real. <laughs> okay, no. Um, yeah, okay, we are fine. We are fine and we are good to go. Oof. Okay. Um, yeah, nice. Final. Oh my god. Actually, like, specifically that we got that figured out for the for the podcast. No, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. We, we could do, like, something like this as I, uh, with, like, okay, hey, as, like, a podcast, like, inspiration run, kind of, like, maybe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So you you I uh you felt <laughs> you felt so smug because you knew way way better than any one of them who like uh, about the Uda loop or what was. Oh the, yeah. no no no! Okay. The, the thing that made me feel smug was when they were like leftists should be reading books about you know like conflict and strategy. Why aren't we doing this? And it's like yeah, I've been feeling this way for years. Um, yeah. Like once I discovered this kind of you know, body of literature, this, this tradition of martial and strategic thought, it was just like, holy fuck, like, you know, mm. it was not hard to evaluate, I don't know, left politics through those lenses and be like, yeah, you know, if we take seriously the struggle part of class yeah. struggle, yeah. and, no, uh, you know, yeah, attended point, People like Lennon were reading fucking Klauswitz and shit. Wasn't, like, I, I think, wasn't there, like, uh, I, I recently, recently, like, re I think read a YouTube comment somewhere that was, like, okay, Engels was, ah, yes, 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 that was, okay, yeah, so Jacobin had, like, recently an interview with Zizek, and it was, like, about, okay, Lennon as a radical opportunist, uh, it was, like, is like, part of a clip there, and somebody had, like, as a top comment, uh, Engels' nickname was like the general because he read so much on military history. So, right, uh, right. I, I have I have no and, idea if that's right, but and, yeah. And here's the thing, right? This is like the mistake is not oh, Lenin was reading Clausewitz. We should make sure we read Clausewitz. It's like no, no. Clausewitz is writing in the 18th century. Yeah. About 18th century war. Yes. Like yeah. he's got some useful shit, no question. But. There's a lot of problems. There's a lot of limits, a lot of issues with Clausewitz. If that's where you stop, like if, if that's as far, as far as you go with your like analysis of, of conflict. And I mean, Clausewitz isn't really a, um, 
he's not really a strategist either. Like he's not a philosophy of strategy. He's a philosophy of war and of con and of conflict to some extent. Hmm. Um, that's so, what he is. He, he he's giving us a model for understanding uh, kind of some of the fundamental features and characteristics of war and. And he explains why war is an uncertain endeavor, but he does not really like his account of st strategy is very um, uh, is entirely subservient to his account of uh, of war. Basically, it's just strategy is like something you do in war um, as a kind of you know, something that guides you in war fighting, and that's obviously that's insufficient. Um, yeah, so that's why it's fucking great to hear these guys talking about Boyd and filtering it through a kind of scientific marxist cybernetic lens like perfect that's maybe like the maybe uh, so in the end like especially in the end i was a little bit um i think maybe a little bit hesitant to uh, um agree or maybe i don't know if like i think my mic can like yeah my mic can like use a little bit of a push okay so in the end i, th I think i was a little bit hesitant um to agree with the points because i think they were like I don't say that they that, okay no I don't say that the points that were raised in the end like as well as like okay the critiquing of like the um um the the, the organizations of like or like the more broader left organizations tied to parliamentary electoralism in the US in in the UK like Momentum and DSA and like okay the I think they focused on the on the US with like okay their relation to the Democrats their Maybe you could okay, like with with um um the purging of Corbyn and the purging of like really like the left parts in the labor in the, in the labor party. Like it's a little bit of a different situation in the UK, I think. Like a little bit, but um yeah, there are still, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there are parallels. So what I like, I think, I think, so I, I, I wasn't, I didn't, I just didn't want to jump to conclusions there. So my, my point mm -hmm. why I was hesitant there is not because I think, okay, I necessarily agree or disagree with them. Um, I can, I would rather say, okay, I would ask, okay, what is it that is leading you to these conclusions? Like what kind of assessment and what is like the, what are possible methodological errors in there? Like, is it, is maybe, like, maybe you're right, and or but are you sure that this kind of analysis isn't, isn't maybe reductive in itself a little bit? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm less, so, I'm kind of to some extent less interested in the, mm -hmm. their kind of assessment of the, you know, failures of the left. Like, no, I, I, that felt, I that know, conversation yeah. kind of felt like a bit, um, they were just kind of um, extemporizing a little bit, you yeah. know. They're just kind of riffing and nope. kind of just loosely for fun, trying to like filter recent, you know, history, recent left history through a sort of very rough Boydist point of view. And uh, I mean, that was it was a bit haphazard. It's interesting, but it's it's sort of not the really interesting part. Is more they are just kind of here's Boyd's here's an overview of Boyd's system of thought and this is something we should take serious this is something we should be doing no, on the left right of, yeah. of, of course no uh, what it was just like a um a point leading up to what I actually want to say which mm. was like their um what like basically the their practical call for okay the left should read like for example more systems theory they should read like thermodynamics rather than like okay all immediately jumping onto Lenin, like all of like the strategic classics, you might say. And yep. um, like before, basically you might say, okay, before you get into specific strategies and then yeah, you have your, like which are themselves like somewhat doctrines or you have like the Kautskyists, you have the Leninists, you have the Maoists, blah, 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 blah. Like you, you first have to get like, okay, what is strategy or what is like an, on a more general level like okay before like oh uh like immediately jumping into this so, okay so, so what i wanted to say like um their like practical recommendation was i would ask myself okay like yes we on the left should should um certainly um certainly basically 
let like this rather like this more boidist view of strategy inform our praxis but does like what does this mean for knowledge and what does this mean for what forms people's like basically basic left world view or i don't so, so basically what i want to what i want to say i'm i want to very much like avoid the um the mistake of like that basically jumps to okay oh you just have to know better and then you will automatically act better i think yeah, like i don't yeah. fucking i i would say okay i don't fucking care about knowledge what people know what matters is what they do and the question is like okay what are the conditions of making like having this better kind of strategic action and what role does reading Boyd or like system theory thermodynamics, what role does this play in there? And that's what I would like. That's yes. why I, yes. I, I, um, I think yeah. a starting point is, I mean, I guess a, a few things, right? Boyd gives us, uh, and this might be helpful. Um, let me pull this up. Hold on. Uh, I had this open before. I have a Red Bull, by the way, so I'm, I'm recharging again. Like, this is, yeah. Okay. So uh, I think something that's helpful is to understand how Boyd conceptualized, like, you know, what, what they're sort of summarizing is um, Boyd's overall kind of his strategic project, I guess. And mm -hmm. what it really, you know, and, and it's, and I think they're right to say it's a project that's specific for a, an adversarial situation, a situation where there's like you and your you know, your forces and there's your rival forces. And I think that perhaps it's fair to say that the, the point they make about, oh, does Boyd assume a certain amount of internal cohesion? I mean, he, he does, but I think only because to the extent that he's thinking about a relatively cohesive, you know, he's writing for um, people within the the setting of the U.S. military institutions, right? Mm, yeah. Within that complex, which is some, yeah. it's not entirely cohesive, but it, put it this way, it's more cohesive than the left. So, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, yeah. So this is, this is already a fundamental problem, right? Mm, um, yeah. The problem of left cohesion, that we have so many different uh, sort of, we're so factional, um, and, and it's it's just an immense problem, right? Like, and, and the, the Corbin lesson is is obviously this the 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 stuff going on in the U.S. with the Democrats, the DSA, is obviously this as well. Okay, so that's that that's just a massive non-trivial issue, right? But before we can, it's kind of like before we can even start. Well, maybe not before. We kind of have two struggles, I guess. That that's maybe part of the diagnosis, right? There's sort of like a okay, there's a struggle against the right and and capital. Um, these forces are kind of aligned. And then there's a struggle against sort of like I, gaining hegemony within the left as a kind of maybe like cybernetic Marxism or you, whatever you want to call it, an accelerationist project. But this strand of thought has to have some kind of hegemony or at least some, you know. And the practices yeah. associated with it. That's not like some. Yeah. 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 Um, what I wanted to as say, a theory like, and a practice. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, what I wanted to say, what I, what I think is interesting is that there, I don't know, like, it's maybe set up this way, um, but it seems to be like, okay, that, um, okay, that um, the agents that like, okay, for adversarial actions, it's like a two player game, basically. And like, okay, you have like two players, both of these have the uh, OODA loops. And certainly those players are, are not necessarily just individual subjects. Are only like they are like militaries, organizations, st like stuff that um, um, itself and has like emergent characteristics where it isn't like okay, oh, one person, one conscious actor makes a decision. Like who could like uh, uh, so that's like an in so that's like an because I wanted to say like the question would be maybe like the a fight against like what if your enemy to a certain extent is not like a specific agent, but a specific set of um, emergent systemic dynamics. Yes, yes, yes. The thing is like, okay, hey, uh, and like, oh, does that fit this like adversarial agent model? But like, oh, okay, no, 
emergent systemic dynamics are already somewhat accounted for in the agents themselves. <laughs> yep. Yep. And um, exactly. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, it's not yeah, yeah. It's not like an agent that's free from like, oh, here are some dynamics that I actually didn't intend, but they somehow popped up. I don't know how. Um yeah. Um so it's like yeah. It, it, what's yeah. kind of cool is like um the you know, in, in uh cyber, the cybernetic tradition, there's the, you know, this that great piece which we we read, right, in, in Antoine's course on Ghost in the War Machine, mm -hmm. um, by Peter Gallison on the the ontology of the ah, yeah, and yeah, Norbert yeah, yeah, Cybernetics yeah. with the yeah. Manichaean and um uh, oh my god, what's the other one called? Um uh Jesus, hold on a sec. Hold on, give me one moment, because uh, I have to look this up. Oh, the Augustinian devils, right? So where um, the, the Manichaean one is kind of the wily, cunning one that reacts to what you're doing, whereas the Augustinian one is sort of like perceived as being this like, you know, just nature or whatever that just kind of is like, it just has its own, you know, it's like a, oh, um, or maybe even a more simple system than that. It's just kind of the sim simplistic system that, that doesn't really like react to you. It just sort of does its own thing. And it's much much easier to kind of you know figure out how the the latter works and respond to it. But I think at a certain point you are kind of up against a blend of the two, right? It has some features of one and some features of the other. Um, the the Manichaean system, and what was the other one? The Augustinian. The, the Augustinian, Augustinian is the kind of like the a good example is like an Augustinian one is when you're playing against um, in a video game. The, the AI, which has just like a very set script that's quite predictable and you can very quickly kind of start exploiting it, right? Mm -hmm. um, whereas then you go up against a human opponent and it's like, oh, okay, shit. okay, like, okay, yeah, 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 okay. Um, yeah, yeah, so, but, but um, yeah, I think you're absolutely right that, that at a certain point, capitalism is, it, like, this, this thing is so complex, this series of interconnected systems um, dynamics um, that we're struggling against, it's almost an even more sophisticated thing than just, you know, if only we were just fighting against a human agent, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you could, you could, of course, like, like somewhat, um, and it's, uh, you could, of course, like, somewhat, uh, like, basically, like, structure it in, in terms of like oh yeah okay but like if the ultimate enemy and i don't even want to say it's like only capital but let's say like this is like the ultimate enemy uh this is like like what are the internal components of of capital and basically like okay oh you let you like kind of try to um it's like okay seed the vision in internal to the enemy and like um yeah you could i don't know like you could try something like like that where like okay in the end it comes somewhat comes down that you're fighting like an an enemy or pitching people against one another um yeah basically and it, that's where the, the class analysis is helpful for us right like that kind of starts to identify who like you know <laughs> yeah yeah it, um mm -hmm. but but anyway i i think um a kind of there was a sort of a point i wanted to make here which is oh yeah yeah <laughs> Um, the other, I think, really fundamental thing to take from Boyd, something that I think is, is a really, really major part of his overall approach, is that he kind of, I mean, and th there, this is maybe not unproblematic. This is the thing I think we on the left would need to think about. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, and I, I mentioned this in the chat, but Boyd is, he, he let me pull up my the, the, the passage from the, the text. Okay, he says, what is the aim or purpose of strategy, he writes? Hmm. to improve our ability to shape and adapt to unfolding circumstances so that we as individuals or as groups or as a culture or as a nation state can survive on our own terms. Um, and he says, um, okay, what's the central theme and the key ideas that underlie strategy? It is one of interaction slash isolation, while the key ideas are the moral, mental, physical means towards realizing this interaction slash isol isolation. And so fundamental to Boyd is this idea that you are trying to, like, you've got these two complex systems going at it with each other, mm -hmm. and the system that it, it kind of um, closes within itself, um, that kind of um, looks inward, that that becomes isolated from its outside, its environment, its opponent, um, is easier to overcome. And at the same mm -hmm. time, one that operates effectively, um, that, that it, a kind of efficacious form of action, involves 
uh, kind of enhancing one's possibility space, basically enhancing the number of possible moves one can make, um, being able to have kind of informational advantages uh, and so on, right? Um, short, 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 uh, a short um, intersection. I think like, I don't know if, if that's the point he like makes or he suggests, but that like, okay, it sounded as if like isolation and like um, um, the minimization of capacities of a system like isolation from the environment and minimization of capacity kind of like are like either are the same or go together that like, Oh, when yeah, some when the system is isolated, then it's capacity for action to shrink. Whereas, okay. Oh, yes. the more it is connected to its environment, the more it's cap its capabilities, um, um, expand. I'm not sure if one would could not find counter examples for that. Where like, okay, hey, yeah, the question is like, I hey, right. with with what is it like? From what is it isolated versus from what with what is it connected? Like, mm -hmm. you can also have like yeah. a, such a such an amount of interdependency that you're like so dependent on your environment. You're very very much connected um, and not isolated at all, but which like robs you of all autonomy. Like, mm -hmm. which is kind of our problem in a way. Yeah, like. I, that was, was just something like uh, I, w I was thinking about. Like, okay, maybe a certain degree of isolation is good. The question is like, okay, from what are you isolated and to mm -hmm. what? Like, that yeah, yeah. it's not it's isolated. Useful. It's like kind of like the same as with like centralization and decentralization. There's like, okay, like these notions are so abstract, you cannot say like, okay, oh, one has these and one has these effects, but rather like, okay what parts are centralized, what parts are decentralized, to what is it isolated, uh, from what is it isolated, to what is it connected, like, that these, the devil lies in the detail there, and, well, yeah. This reminds me of something in um, uh, Martin Van Krevel's Command and War, where, which is a text I have a lot of issues with, and Van Krevel is a, kind of a real nutcase in some ways, he's, he's a very weird <laughs> figure, he's a, a military historian, right? But he, he has this one great thing where he says, um, you know, that there's, historically in war, there have been two... Mm -hmm. Uh, responses to the problem of uncertainty and command, basically, right? Like how you deal with spiraling issues of uncertainty and friction and so on. One is to try and create this like massive organization that gathers as much information as possible. Like you just enhance your like ability to deal with this as much as possible. Or the other is to like pare down and create a like organization that is very capable of functioning uh, like on minimal amounts of information. Um, like that, that, that isn't, you know, that, that's like very, like kind of almost a very simple system. Um, mm. That That's just kind of like, like, like a, you know, here a, a nice example might be something like a, like, you know, a cell in Al Qaeda's prison, you know, terrorist network, right? Which is just kind of like this own little autonomous, like thing. It just deals with its one particular little project. And so, because it's, it's it, you know, it only has one or two little, you know, small objectives to focus on. It can just kind of do that and not worry mm. about anything else. Like. Uh, and so that's a nice way of, you know, you overcome this problem of like decisional labor, you know, information uh, overload and so on, right? Where it's like also this, this point of like, okay, you don't need to know everything. You only like in military, you, you only need to know the information that's relevant for your tasks. You don't need to worry about any, anything else. Like, why do you have these orders in, in what kind of plan they are integrated into? Yep. Just do your thing and okay. Mm. And and you, you give a great deal of like uh, autonomy to do that thing, right? You just like, here's your goal. Do it however the fuck you need to do it. We trust your like, you know, your you've had some training and preparation and giving you like a range of skills to like do your thing. But you know, it's up to you. You're you're the person who has is tasked with this challenge. You will specialize in it and you will figure out the like the way to go with it, right? Um it's kind of funny. I this is actually something that comes up in my in my thesis, basically, that like most of the military texts that explicitly confront the fog of war and the problem of uncertainty view it as just this intractable problem that has to be solved and reduced in general, right? But one of the things we learn is that the actual effective functioning of many organizations necessarily involves the like uh, specifically withholding information, like creating fogs of war, creating uncertainties within your own system so that it can function better, so that it doesn't get overwhelmed and so on, or that portions of it don't. Um, uh, so basically, so basically, it's like in so that like okay, the, uh, that that the conclusion would be that the entire like problem that's or that's something that's viewed as a problem from the outset of like okay oh uncertainty itself that like okay the problem with uncertainty isn't uncertainty itself but like where and how much there is that like exactly like, like it's like, like okay hey uncertainty itself is not the problem based no. that was that would be like the the uncertainty itself can be a resource if it's yes uh, okay, mm -hmm, okay.
Yeah, it, but both for uh, and 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 indeed is a also kind of for fundamental attack, feature. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, also for yeah. attack. Like. <laughs> it's a fundamental feature of the operation of. Co I mean, this is the other thing. It's just a fundamental feature of complex systems in general. A, a system that's that doesn't have some amount of um, uh, kind of like um, uncertainty in terms of how it interacts built into it, um, it, it, it isn't kind of can't achieve emergent forms of behavior basically it's too simple um is is uncertainty kind of like um like to to somehow <laughs> summarize it is basically like, okay uncertainty is there when you cannot like basically like mechanically forecast if you put like these inputs into the system then because you already know how it will, will react to certain stimuli then these outputs will come out that like you cannot I mean you cannot completely <laughs> forecast it. Uh, yeah, this is, that, this is another problem. There's lots of different ways but, in which we could define uncertainty, right? There's yeah, like, yeah, but like to get like the rough forms. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, that, that's to, fine. That's to get like works, the, a, a rough, rough, like basically, you don't know, you don't know precisely what will happen when something happens. Like what, yes. what the effect? Yeah. Okay, what the effect? Yeah, they're like cause-effect relation, right? Okay, yeah, yeah that, that this isn't like completely closed and you can like neatly track it and like ah this happened this this happened this this happened this and because you can neatly track it you can like you you basically can forecast the future yeah, of, yeah. A, of I mean, an effect okay yeah okay. there's a few other like forms i could you know rattle off at you but i, I don't think we're gonna get it's not gonna be that helpful to do that right now um I mean, <laughs> maybe, maybe that's maybe a podcast looks... yeah maybe that's yeah, like, yeah. A podcast. like yeah. I, I mean i i mean that's something i have to do in my i'm doing in my phd right now that's actually the next bit yeah. i have to write and i'm really dreading it like it's gonna be this <laughs> overview of like here's how the greeks conceptualized uncertainty back then here's mm -hmm. like and then basically the moment where you have to start to get a real like paradigm shift in it is the emergence of statistics as a mathematical discipline, because there you start actually understanding how it works, not just as an epistemic thing, but as an ontological thing. Um, okay. Uh, mm. As a kind of an ontological ah, principle that, like, of systems. Okay. Okay. That like, yeah. Okay. That like, uh, um, uh, that uncertainty isn't something that like, okay, you just need more knowledge and then it wouldn't like, it's not like an imperfection of knowledge, but it's like something you simply cannot solve. It, it, it's also a, an actual like feature of you know actual th systems in the yeah, world yeah, and how they yeah. operate. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So it's both. It's both. It's like it's a kind of onto epistemic thing that you're grappling with. Yeah, beautiful, um, beautiful word onto epistemic. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's straight from the the introduction of the PhD. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> No, but that would like actually be a cool like um, if you wanna. I sometimes I I would think like maybe for the podcast actually that like at some points of time it would actually make more sense like if I just take a back like if I take a back seat and try to inter interject with some thoughts, and you like maybe maybe give like kind of like a primer of like I or like things yeah yeah elaborate sure. on the main idea. And I try to come up with comments and ideas, and we just then riff on that, basically. Yeah, yeah, that sounds good. And you can ask me questions, and then we can yeah. get into. Then we can riff, right? Yeah, but um, yeah. yeah, yeah. Because like you good. are like obviously in the advantage here, like with regards to the knowledge, like. Well, yeah. What could be cool is if we're thinking about it. If we want the podcast to be about okay, like here's somebody who's doing stuff and is interested in strategy, and then here's. But we're and we're interested in it like kind of lessons of strategy for the left. You can kind of bring that like for the left side, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, somewhat. You, yeah, I think yeah. you are more immersed in that than I am at the yeah, moment. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, definitely. Yeah. I, um, oh, go I ahead. mean, I I tried these like like with the stream. I st I tried these like um, little. Like the question of like, okay, what is it even doing? What is it even that I'm doing with the stream? That like some, like when I comment on, for example, like I listen to a podcast, I, I watch a YouTube video, I watch an interview and mostly it's like about like left politics or something. And I, like basically the commentary I make is already on like a meta level that I'm saying like, oh, look what this person is doing here is a mistake of this and that kind. And like, I'm, basically not get like i'm already jumping to like the meta level of like oh look this is an example for a larger pattern of behavior which is like counterproductive and i'm giving this pattern of behavior like a name or like try to grasp that so we like might in the future um uh, not not repeat this pattern of behavior that much anymore 
And like, okay, like, what is that? That I'm even like, sometimes I'm just trying to understand. I'm just doing it intuitively. And that this is like a certain kind of strategy itself. Like that this is like a kind of strategizing itself. Um, yeah, but like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to gra like, yeah, I, I have like the point of like, okay, hey, strategy for the left, but also like trying in like a very amateurish sense, practicing this shit myself a little bit and... Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's funny. I it's funny this we're having this whole conversation now too because there's um somebody literally was just uh, one of the like military people that I follow on Twitter was just was tweeting today like what is um they, they, were, they were first I asked this question on Twitter like you know can people recommend me like what do you think of what do you think of like strategic literature what are like the foremost examples and I think what they actually meant was like actual literary fiction like strategy appearing in that setting. But mm -hmm. me and I think a lot of the other responders meant it as just what has been written about strategy, right? Like what are the key texts on strategy in general? I mean, yeah. maybe they meant both. I'm not sure. Yeah. But then they then they realized, oh shit, we have to ask another question. What is strategic literature? And obviously, the other other question is just what is strategy, right? And you know, my my very first kind of I didn't say everything. The thing the first thing I said was like, well, I think before you even do this, or or a fundamental thing you have to do if you're going to answer this question is disentangle strategy from kind of martial thought basically that it's the, the history and etymology of strategy is in martial thought like it's the the original greek word for strategy strategos basically just meant like the the um uh the practice of war fighting like the things that generals did in war it was like the things that generals are concerned with um the general was the strategos um so it was like generalship, basically. That that would be like a good translation of, of I think, of it. Like okay. that's what strategy mm -hmm. was. It was just whatever generals do. Um, whereas obviously now, uh, you know, at a certain point, strategy transcends the military context. You know, much much later, and, and the, the word itself actually slips out of etymological use for so many centuries, and only really starts reappearing in European uh, use. Again, in like the I think um, like the sort of 17th century or around that 16th, so 17th centuries, um, and really only starts picking up steam in the um, like, like 18th, 19th. Um, anyway, sorry, I'm, I'm uh, going on a little no, no, like digression no, here. Um, maybe 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 a, a very short comment that like I know this will not be precise, but that like um, um, a distinct is a distinguishing characteristic of strategy is like the recognition. Of the fact that decision making and thought takes place under time and material pressure. Yeah, that for basic, sure. That basic, like that, like okay, most of the like philosophical stuff, like argumentation, logic, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, like mm. as a completely That's abstract, th as a completely ex abstract like scheme and practice, like doesn't really take into account. It's like completely external to it that these things happen as practices in time and um, time and material pressure and that you don't have like for eternity to argue to make decisions and that like okay in like it's it's like an external thing and that we're, we're in strategy this these factors that there is like time and resource constraints or like let's say like resource constraints is like basically the starting point is in, it is integrated into the practice of decision making itself it's like yes yeah. yes and, and, and this point you're making i think is precisely why there has never been a philosophy of strategy really no one has ever really done this philosophy this is anti strategic of... itself like <laughs> yeah yeah exactly it, it's it, it, uh, strategy has too much proximity to action hmm. um uh, and and so the, the thing I didn't say in my tweet, you know, the thing I said in my tweet was like, yeah, you need to do this disentanglement, right? You need to think, mm -hmm. okay, what is strategy? You know, if all, but I wanted to tweet what I didn't say, because I, I, you know, I was like maybe <laughs> a little scared of like, you know, pissing off people I don't know on Twitter randoms. So maybe I should have just fired it off. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But was like, okay, if all your conception of strategy is, is this kind of like strategy versus tactics, grand strategy, you know, strategy versus the operational level, like the entire martial concepts of strategy. If that's mm -hmm. all you're doing, you know, here's the things you're omitting, right? You're omitting like cybernetics. I think cybernetics has a really important connection to strategy, basically. Um, you know, that because it's, it's kind of, in some ways cybernetics kind of functions as like a strategic model. It's a model of, of a particular form of action within a system, right? Um, and there's a there's a great connection between strategy and cybernetics, which is this navigation and steering, right? 
mm -hmm. um, that that's kind of at the root of of cybernetics. You know, that's what that's... Kyber meant in Greek, like yeah. it was to steal, right? Super, super, super short intersection. I'm sorry, but like that's that's something I've been also really been like trying to get. It's like okay, that that that's also like what matters in philosophy or like in in like science as an abstract not in scientific practice like in real science but like is not is there like simply always something wrong or something right is it false or true but the question is like in if you're actually doing like research or trying to find your way in the world it's not like is it true or false it's like okay how close to truth or how close to or falsity is what it or, works yeah or yeah it's like like what allows me to navigate in the world and um, the, the word that Francois Julien uses is, is it efficacious? Does it produce efficacy? Um, yeah. Uh, hmm. yeah. It's like, it's like really, that's like, okay, does it allow, or like, does it give me orientation? Maybe mm -hmm. it's like orientate, yeah. like navigate, like, does it give me orientation or not? Because something can be true and that's nice. Like I found something out, but if it doesn't give me any kind of orientation for further decision-making and action, yeah, yeah, okay, that's yeah, then it's useless if something's false and I find that out and then like, oh, the, but this now gives me a new direction for thought and action. Like that's cool. Um and there's also where oversimplification, for example, has its justified fun role that like yeah, you can sure. you should start with something that's oversimplified because it sets you up to a certain path. And, whereas and if you just if you just straight up dive into the adequate thing, like the real thing, you have no idea where to go. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. And okay, so so you know, there's one thing, right? You need you, yeah. you, you definitely need this like cybernetic navigational or I mean orientation. I mean, that's just Boyd says, right? Orientation is like the key, the fundamental thing that you're doing in the OODA loop. That's like the crucial step. That's where the interesting, mm -hmm. important shit kind of happens in some ways, right? So there, there's that. That's one thing you need. I think you'd be talking about, I think another important component probably in this like philosophical project of strategy would be, and I don't know very much about this, but I know, I just know it's important is like Charles Sanders Peirce's um, philosophical pragmatism and, you know, his account of abduction that there's, because, you know, pragmatism is the like philosophy of action, right? Like it, mm. it is the attempt to kind of bridge that, uh, that, that's, that's the one major philosophical attempt to kind of try and get there. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I don't have a, you know, I'm still kind of learning this stuff, but it seems like, you know, in Boyd, he, so he doesn't have this term. He doesn't have access to the concept of abduction. He hasn't read Charles Sanders purse, even though purse is like, had already, you know, uh, his writing already existed at the time mm. Boyd shows up, but Boyd just yeah. isn't aware of him. But, and it's like, Boyd d does this, the way he frames it is you do, you have this, like, um, you do induction and deduction and you go back and forth between the two right um and you're like the process through which you create these new concepts and i think the the overall thing that kind of happens in the middle there is is an ab it's a, is a kind of abductive process but i, I kind of need to learn more about the like hmm. specifics of this terminology its history purse and all this shit like i haven't even started on that and that, that's going to be a, like after my phd thing for okay. sure like that's it's just not going to get in here because it's too yeah. much yeah um so there's that I, right i think you need game theory I think you need uh, kind of a Bayesian, uh, Bayesian like inference and probability. That's important. Um. <laughs> no, I, I, I had like a, I had I started a seminar on Bay on Bayesianism at the New Center and by Muf Anna Longo and she like in the beginning of the seminar she she somewhat um, defined like Bayesianism as like okay the science of making decisions in the most efficient way or some something like that and then it really got into the technical details and i couldn't follow any because it was like so like advanced statistics kind of shit and i couldn't yeah, follow it's anymore kind of hardcore. um but like on the on the more formal abstract side like that's like okay that is interesting um with this like okay like yeah it's it's like somewhat of a science of decision making somewhere yeah. basically I mean, can it's... be can be applied universally well, what you're kind of doing, as as I understand it, is you continually making these like revisable hypotheses about the probability of things happening, um, and they can be subjective. And so, that actually, this I shared it. I, I don't know if I sent it to you, but I shared it on Twitter recently. This, um, um like basically my favorite strategy gamer slash content creator, this guy called Jorbs, he made a YouTube video recently 
It's like a maybe two hour video, which is a lecture by him explaining his strategic approach, his approach to strategy. Um, and he never defined strategy, but basically he's like, yeah, I I was heavily influenced by kind of Bayesian approaches and he basically what he explains is like a bayesian approach to how you use strategy in games like how you just continually um kind of create these like he kind of says you know i don't want like a set theory for how i go about this game i never feel like i've solved the game i always just have these hypotheses that i'm continually testing and i have some degree of confidence in in the hypotheses but I'm always open to new data and having, it's, it's actually a very Boydian approach as well, right? Like for him, having skepticism is very important as well. And the other thing that's really fundamental is just like the continual process of testing and kind of iteration. Now, there's a huge problem, which is that a game is great because you can just play it again and again and again. Yeah, and if yeah. you lose, all, you, all that happens is you start at the beginning. And so it's like a very safe environment to do this. Whereas in the real world we don't necessarily have that kind of luxury where we can just you know we might only get one one shot you um, might yeah you might say like that there i don't know if that's the right the right formulation but um let, let's let's say like i said let, maybe there's a tendency in games for like all data acquisition to be somewhat equal whereas like okay like and that's uh, not now that's not uh, um Basically, basically, what I want to Depends get at is, like, yeah, yeah, basically, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, that was like oversimplified. Um, um, the the point that I wanted to make, like, uh, what you said, like with the game, it's like a safe environment you can play it again, and again, and again. That there, like, no mistake, and mistakes are also like data acquisition to like improve your hypotheses. Um, no mistake is like ends data acquisition, like, terminates data acquisition and the, and the possibility of, like, new hypotheses in general, like, whereas in life, that's very much the case. Um, yeah. There are mistakes. If you make them, it's over. And, um, um, yeah, maybe, um, like, a few of these, like, f a few critical mistakes, and then it's also over. And, um, yeah, fuck, I don't, I don't have, like, a proper formulation that I want to get at. But, like, basically I want to get at, like, okay, what differentiates life from a game with, like, life as, like, the safe environment, whereas li where, uh, yeah, games as, like, the safe environment, whereas with life, where things are actually at stake and where you cannot, like, play it over and over and over again. Like, where you don't respawn. Um, that's, like, yeah, that's simply what I want yeah, to get yeah. at. I, I don't have but a proper formulation. But basically, I think you're kind of having to combine all of these different approaches and disciplines and you kind of cobble something together out of all of that. And then, you know, there maybe you've got kind of like a strategic, you know, I think all, these are all maybe different, like all, all of these things have something to offer for an overall discourse of strategy, maybe something like this, right? Or a strategic approach or disposition. Um, but yeah, I, I, I would kind of say like, you know, the left should... Uh, you know, we would do well to familiarize ourselves with these. Um... Another one maybe is the um, the Greek tradition of metas, the the cunning intelligence. Um, I... And I guess, and, and another is like the Chinese approach to strategy, which Francois Julien describes, and it's a little bit different to the the Western tradition of schema, you know, kind of thought and action. Um, uh, yeah. I've... I've always like also like I've asked myself from a like yeah from a strategic standpoint basically it's like okay hey um like how do you make these things how do you make these things like get traction like how a, apart from simply being like a doctrine or apart from simply being just knowledge how do they become actually influential yeah like, that's I think, like the, I think games like that's is the one answer. Maybe, but the thing is also like, okay, hey, like, then you need, like, somewhat of, you need to somewhat, like, trigger a culture that, like, ta starts to take game, to take games serious. I mean, to a certain extent, we, al we already have them that, like, w remember, mm -hmm. like, when you, you start watching YouTube and then, like, at some point in time, you, you, like, arrived at a video that you never were interested yeah you never were interested at the beginning but you just somewhat still watch it and like you learn like obscure facts and obscure stuff about like the intricacies of this or that video game or this or that video game series 
and like where things are taken like into such a detail and so serious like which is fucking laughable at some point but like okay hey how did like how do you tap into that that culture maybe and like channel it into the strategy direction like yeah, i guess that's tough. somewhat what you want to try with the with the videos then um, yeah i mean i'm just I'm, i mean I, it's funny I, i'm not you know with my own project hmm. for that stuff i'm i i'm not worrying too much about the like how might this be useful for the left and i'm just kind yeah, of going the... for like how can how can i forge a closer link just between what people are doing in games and this wider what's the connection between games and the strategic tradition basically and yeah. where can i find i mean there's some that are very obvious right game theory and bayesian approaches already people are doing that stuff in games a lot that's happening already um but what about some of the other stuff um i'm yeah now what what i like how uh, and maybe that's like simply my op, like based on my op, op, so like very limited observations on like okay observing like a certain kind of like you might say like cultural shift inside of the left I, in, in like certain sections of the left that was always tied to certain charismatic personalities who were like somewhat pushing for something like either the first time or either the first time in a little bit more like popular environment like um who popularized certain ideas and then like you you need to have like somewhat of a centralized figure and then these things start to dissipate and take on a life on their on their own um that's maybe how to like because like that's the thing like you need to like with regards to like okay how do we make these these this knowledge become like actually influential and have like practical consequences for the left like how do you distribute this not like yeah how do you make yeah, it influential and um i think really like having some kind of central figure like i i, I simply have to think about okay hey like people who like, also can become like role models like people who people can look up to people can be inspired by um like i needed to think about like to a certain extent mark fisher but also to a certain extent i feel like somewhat michael brooks to a certain extent in, and these kind of strange in, attractors right yeah and um yeah because like if you if you only throw that like i don't know if you only throw that that knowledge like into like a left discourse I think it like either gets like lost completely or it just doesn't become like practical like it just doesn't How have any kind of yeah, practical like uh, consequences like it doesn't get translated into any kind of praxis and yeah I mean I, I think the other just kind of like broadly important thing is just I think we we just have to learn that like this kind of I, I do think this point in the podcast overall is broadly a good one right that the like um if we're spending our time working on political projects that fundamentally are just about maintaining you know the status quo of like what vestiges of social democracy we have that that's a losing fight and that clearly we need to be doing something that's like more yeah, gen yeah like generating new hype um I mean, personally, I, I have this, I'm not sure how to formulate this exactly, mm -hmm. but I have this nagging feeling that like, we also just kind of need a, like a rebrand to, to crassly use this term. Like communism's just, I don't know. I feel like it's just a dead brand. Like this, this is brutal, but like the hammer and sickle point I made before is like, I mm -hmm. think the killer here, it's like. When people see the hammer and sickle logo, they're like, what the fuck is that? I don't even know what a fucking sickle is. Like, it doesn't resonate with people anymore, right? We're just mm -hmm. reusing this old thing that had something to do with, like, you know, um, early, like, late 19th and early 20th century, like, agricultural, industrial societies, um, which do not really resemble our societies anymore. We need a new, like, obviously, we need a new imagery. Our imagery is moribund and bereft. But mm -hmm. I think, I think that... I guess this is the aesthetics, right? Our kind of left aesthetics, right? But I, I also wonder if, like, you just need some kind of cynical... Tr I think the other thing, too, is because we know we have to be updating our models and shit, our old model, i.e. Marxism, communism, anarchism, whichever combination of those things, is insufficient. It is not good enough. Um, 
right? Well, we whatever we do yeah. is not that. It's going to be something like we're going to draw on that shit. It informs mm -hmm. us, but we're not going to be doing that. We're going to be doing something else. We're going to be doing something like, uh, i.e., that's going to be taking into account this, like, you know, the strategic stuff, a bunch of science. You know, clearly that has to be fundamental, right? Um, new philosophical developments, new cultural and aesthetic developments, and rolling all that shit up together, um, maybe with a, with a renewed ecological perspective as well. Um, mm -hmm. So what do you call that politics? Well, I think we probably should give it a new name. I don't think we should call that communism anymore. But that, that's just, I, don't mm -hmm. know, that's a, I feel like that's a very well, heretical thing to say, but that's something I kind of feel quite strongly about. Um, I, I've never really mm -hmm. talked about to anyone about this before, Dude. but I, that's, that's, that's a nagging thought I've had for a thanks. very, very long time. It feels good to get it off my chest. Thanks for your trust, first of all. Um, the thing, I don't, I don't feel that strongly about it, but I can certainly understand it. And I do agree with like, okay, hey, that um, certainly like, okay, if you, if you said like, okay, hey, what do we need to draw on? Um, that like the, the old imagery, the old kind of um, aesthetics, like be it slogans, be it titles, be it um, imagery itself, be it like social kind of like protocols that are associated with that somewhat. Um, but they like, do, do they provide more cohesion or do they provide more inhibition to like soak up these new developments and um uh, i was going to say maybe like in the beginning some like maybe left accelerationism was kind of like yeah yeah i mean course, it doesn't right. it it doesn't really suffice as like a good title anymore um yeah that, that bridge got burned unfortunately yeah we lost that uh, one we lost that fight yeah that true um, I, I, I still it was like, cool though. It was fucking cool. I, I, I still like to call myself left accelerationist though. I still like to yeah, do yeah. that. Well, it's because um, it's because it's because right. Then, you, by saying that, you feel like you are like the Marxist, the person who calls themselves a Leninist or a communist or a Marxist or whatever. There, they sound like this old fuddy-duddy guy wearing the like the old hat. You know what I mean? Like they sound like some fun, fucking cliche, some larper. That's what they fucking sound like. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. And when you call yourself a left accelerationist, you're really putting a stake in the ground, like semiotically. There, you're kind of symbolically. You're saying like, no, I'm someone who's doing like a a, a politics of the future, not of the past. Um, mm. And I do like that yeah. element about it. But yeah, I, I mean, I think obviously that one didn't quite work out for us. We lost yeah. that one as well, and we can't be sentimental I, about that either. Same for the I same think, reasons, right? I, 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 I yeah. On to the next I, thing. Fuck it. <laughs> I think I think maybe maybe here's like a was like a somewhat methodological note um with regards to like okay strategy and like let's say like for example like the role of the welfare state or like the role of um basically let's say like any specific means any specific means any specific tactic whatsoever that like okay hey um um uh, so, so what I would be very of, and I, I I don't say I don't think you said that, and I don't know if if on the GRU pod they were kind of like hinting at that. I'm I'm not completely sure, but that, like basically, okay, um, I certainly agree that any any political like strategy and praxis that like is limited to comp to only conserving like the the remains of the welfare state that are still there and like to really just defend it against like neoliberal attacks and is nothing beyond that is basically doomed it's like it's it's it's, it's basically doomed yeah um, we know it's doomed because it's been losing yeah but th that doesn't mean that like okay oh now we have to stop defending the welfare state now we can basically now now we can join the neoliberals and say like you know what fuck the welfare state we are just gonna do UBI for everybody and the welfare state can completely can oh completely yeah no no dissolve. of course not of course um, not the point the point yeah the, the yeah. point is the point is, is that okay how can like to re simply to say okay to reevaluate the strategic role of defending the welfare state mm -hmm. yeah. and how is it combined with other aspects in the strategy and that it like um that um it like at least at least the defending of the welfare state like becomes like something of like a uh let's say like a secure base from which like other projects can be um yeah, can be yeah. started i mean, I, I or, mean personally yeah. i i, I kind of think you go a different way you you like 
what you do, I mean, this is kind of, I, I think actually Boris Johnson in the UK is an interesting like case study in this, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So the conservatives are doing all kinds of shit, right? They, they get up to all kinds of shit. They always institute all kinds of reforms and, they, you know, usually it involves just gutting, you know, cutting, cutting out other chunks of our welfare state, et cetera, mm -hmm. right? But they, don't, they never say they're going to be doing all that shit when it comes, when they're electioneering. They just say, we're going to give you Brexit. That's what we're doing. We figure out a wedge issue and we just like hammer that. And that's all we fucking talk about. And whenever anyone asks us any question, no, 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 we don't answer that question. We just bring it back to Brexit with like some devious sleight of hand. And I think that's kind of the left needs something like that too. Like you figure out what thing you have mm -hmm. that you're going to sell that's really fucking popular and you bang that fucking drum. And then when you get in power, you do all the other shit. You like, you know, um, you put it on your program, obviously. Like you have to have some amount of transparency. I think that's one thing that necessarily has to differentiate us from the right. Um, but we don't, we don't make it super explicit. We don't draw attention to it. We just like, you know, once we get in, we just smuggle all that other good shit in there as well. And we, just, you know, um, I mean, maybe we have to also pick our fights. There's certain things we have to defend and we have to be ardent defenders of them. But we definitely have to be strategic about like, you know, the the fights we we get, you know, we publicly, I think this is another thing we have to have a better conception of on the left, right? It's like what we do publicly um, as part of our strategy. And then there are like internal strategic conversations where we like figure out, you know, all the other shit we're doing behind the scenes, right? That's, like, yeah, yeah, there we can, we can call us each other comrades and communists or whatever we want in that <laughs> setting. That's all good. Um, you know, no. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I completely, like, I, I very, very much agree, but at the, at the same time, like, at the same time, there's this like, I think that leads to a to to like um, a question that I have like not at all figured out or like I'm I'm still struggling. It's like basically do it. I think basically it, it boils down to the relation between like democracy and knowledge. That like basic like mm -hmm. because strategy and like in in this like strategy in the sense of like okay hey how do you how do you achieve a certain thing is pretty much about knowledge. It's like like what what likely effects something has is not a matter of democratic decision making that's like you don't decide like okay uh, that's like yeah that's good stuff. but basically it's like okay how like or basically with the with the uh, behind the scenes like okay where where is the line drawn in the behind the scenes and the public and like okay what role does democratic decision making because democratic is like the the dream of like democratic decision making is like this oh like everyone is always involved like we know that isn't possible like direct democracy is pretty much like not that not that nobody wants to spend every th every day in, in a meeting um uh but that does like um um yeah but like uh, Benjamin Breton has has a really good had a really good formulation in a, in a talk with like Nick Schoenig about the reference of the real. He said like okay, there's a difference between like a democracy of means and a democracy of ends. That like basically democracy of means is okay that you choose yeah. your means by democratic means. decision making, or democracy of ends is like okay mm -hmm. is democracy and the furthering of democracy the end that you try to put that you try to put specific means to and these means don't necessarily need to be uh democratically chosen or like to a lesser extent and um like it's like you, yeah it's, yeah you want to hear something cool about this from aristotle <laughs> no, <yes. laughs> all right motherfucking aristotle has something to say about this so, and it's kind of funny so he's a bit of a like he fails this, this test but like okay he, he said something interesting so he says right that like you have the, the person who's supposed to deal with the like um kind of the problems of uncertainty and strategizing and so on is someone who's prudent but the okay. prudent man fundamentally is always um at the end of the day focused on the ends the ends always have to structure and define everything else like mm -hmm. you can't use any means that are in any way like antithetical to the ends whereas the cunning man uh, the the man of base cunning, who Aristotle is very disparaging of, is just about the means, right? We'll just like do whatever it takes to like get the thing done. Um, and I, 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 there's some resonance here, right? The the strategy fundamentally, the the kind of the essence of strategy is is this. I think to to me is about this like the means part of it. Actually, the means equation. Now, obviously, it has a relation to the ends and like. 
determining you know what ends you work towards there's some strategy to do with that as well um but but i think like there's some some aspect of it which is like okay what is the most effective way of getting this thing done right of achieving this mm -hmm. like thing that i want um but 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 were you what but was the kind of takeaway here with this like uh democracy of ends and means like we should have a we should focus on the democracy of ends and then we have our systems in place that like determine the most effective means of achieving them and that that's not where you necessarily need a like heavily democratic like the democracy of ends is the one that should be heavily heavily democratized where like everyone is involved and then the democracy of means is where you have greater i don't know specialization and like i don't know whatever or, or was there a different takeaway from no. from how i'm no, the thing is, I didn't. I didn't. I only mentioned this like uh, these two categories by Benjamin Bratton because I, f I feel like they they pin down something very good. Yeah, like, that's yeah, they do. Otherwise, very that much left useful. in conf confusion. Like these are useful concepts. I didn't. I didn't say I have like, okay, we should behave uh, uh, to uh, to these like in this or that way. But like, I think your case is interesting. With like, okay, we should have like a heavily have like basically that the normative part the normative part okay where do we want to go should be like very much uh very much like heavily democratized whereas okay so how do like, like the question how do we get there is the question of knowledge and not of democracy and yeah, um, yeah. That, that of I, science I, right yeah, of, yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. Like knowledge, like and I would like I'm I'm sympathetic to that approach, um, but I also don't I also wouldn't like unconditionally say like okay that's like that's like our model that we now no, have exactly. to run with there it, might be like, shortly there might be cases like where okay hey um this model might turn and might turn to into its opposite that like basically okay oh um that like a certain democratization of the democracy of like the democracy of means is necessary to not let the means turn into like the opposite, basically, in like yeah, the effects. of course, there's always this danger and, that you just get um, um, so consumed by the means that you lose sight. And like, and, and this is a big thing in a lot of the military writings, actually, that your means have to be proportional to your ends. That's like a you know constant refrain, basically. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm I'm very very much I'm I'm completely I'm comp very very much for like more ruthlessness and more like okay, hey, uh, like I I think we concern like especially on the left we concern ourselves way too much with like oh my god every like the idea that like okay how to get somewhere is determined is rather determined by okay let's say like material circumstances and objectivity and not that much about like and of objectivity i mean like okay tendencies of systems and so on and what affects them, rather than like oh is it democratically chosen or not and i think because we like and the effect of that is also not that like yeah okay we just have like these endless discussions and the real decisions are also not taken like nobody is fucking uh like it's like um ro here rodrigo nunes uh, has a very has a very good um has a very in, in his book here the neither vertical nor horizontal which is like by the way i think like fits pretty well into like the overall strategy discussion like it's uh discussion um is um he said like if the uh imagine a lever if a lever is like already pulled way like very much to one side you don't oh you shit is this a, is this is this gonna be a trolley problem meme no 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 <laughs> if, if the lever is or like uh, imagine like if the lever is already pulled like very much to one side um, you have to use a lot of force to get it pulled like r a little bit like into the middle and maybe a little bit to your side. So y you cannot, you cannot like, if there's already a hegemony of one position and of one practice, you cannot respond. Your response cannot be like a super fucking nuanced thing. Like you have to use some force in order to get it to your side, basically. Mm -hmm. Like that's like yeah, the, yeah. that's like the. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. I like this. Yeah, yeah. Um, because like if you like. If you use too much nuance there, like you, you won't have enough force. Like it, it won't have enough impact, basically. Like, yeah, it's like a simple. Of course, it's simplified, but like sometimes, yeah. Um, to nail a point, sometimes it 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 works. Um, to bring a point home, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think another just in, kind of interesting question for the left is like, 
I think to be kind of cunning and sort of devious, to, to be efficacious, sometimes you just kind of have to be like a little underhanded. You have to be kind of dirty. And okay. it's like that doesn't sit well with like the left kind of our principles, our modus operandi, right, with like a democratic approach and so on. And so it's like how you reconcile those things. I think that's something we need to take actually very – that's not a straightforward thing. And I, I, I'm definitely like, you know, uh, sympathetic to this idea that like, um, yeah, maybe like, you know, but, 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 but I also kind of feel like you can't just foreclose on the possibility of having some, some like evil, some wickedness as part of your like approach. Right. I think, I think what we should do is, um, like there's, let, let, let's put it like this. I think that, um, to a lot of the stuff that has become like this kind of fork wisdom on the left. Like this like, okay, stuff that is like not even like explicitly put, but sometimes it's like through the sheer socialization in like a left sphere, you just like kind of am like that it becomes part of your of your personality. It becomes part of your mental apparatus, like the way you see and approach the world. Like they're basically oh hello Zengador. Hi. Um a new follower um like simply this simple way of yeah um like it's like very very intuitive feel like very in a very intuitive directions uh uh reactions to something um um i think there is a certain core like kernel of truth in there um but this kernel of truth should be like extracted and should be like basically said okay like um like what is the what is the exact kernel of truth let's let's take for like to give an example um when i was building like my streaming setup the last couple of months and i was watching a lot of like tech youtubers and like reviewing shit like i really really felt myself how i fell into this tech rabbit hole of like optimal technical optimization for technical optimization's sake like it's not it wasn't any more about like, like not because uh, like, like any... tech ontology like set in for you yeah no, no it was like really like i really really felt like i'm like i'm fucking like like my i i spend sometimes my free time simply scrolling through the amazon app on my phone simply to see like oh what technical stuff is there that i could use for my stream even though i don't fucking need it like um and this is something that like it kind of like sneaks into you like as like a pattern of behavior like in an underground way like i mean that's somewhat how, how ideology works and the thing is like um um that okay so there is a certain like that's like okay it, it really gets you into like okay there's like technical optimization for optimization's sake the basically the instruments become their own their own end um like okay oh especially like yeah, tech dangerous. stuff tech stuff becoming like this like getting you into like this hyper consumerist mindset um where it's like oh my god uh brand X xy came up with this and this new chip which is like marginally better than the old one and i will not use it anywhere because it's completely overpowered and completely overpriced like but i still saw a face to, uh, to it like um that you that you get into this kind of attitude like i feel like as like a like uh like as maybe like a res ressentiment or as like a attitude is pretty much well embodied in in the left as like the sphere and there is like a kernel of truth to that and I've experienced that kernel of truth but at the same time the the consequence of that of saying like okay yeah therefore I will never engage with like tech and want to will ne don't have no interest in engaging with this or understanding it or whatsoever is to, is completely misplaced and so that's what i mean like we need to have we need to preserve this kernel of truth because that's that there is like a reality to it but then ask ourselves okay hey what does this kernel of truth really mean and what does it like not mean and um <sighs> i don't really have like a good formulation for this but um like, yeah, I think you you kind of like get what I'm or like you kind of yeah I think I know what somehow you mean. get um, what I'm getting at. I think we should maybe like loop back to the um I don't know Boyd. Ah we've gone, yes, we've yeah, run away she, from him a little bit. <laughs> um, yeah, 
is there I don't know is there anything else you wanted to ask me or kind of cover? Uh, um, give me a second. Like I, from I, the pod or his his work. I throw up the here's the boy here's the boy to pick again the Uda loop. Oh, we should talk about the the, the diagram. Yeah, this is important. Yeah, okay, the, yes, you... yes. Ah, yes. Yeah, I, I threw it up on screen. Did you have a chance um, to read the the link I sent you? And I listened to the fucking podcast. I didn't. I cannot l listen and read at the same okay, time. Right, two good, different good, things. Good. Well, that's that's good because that means I get to actually explain this. So, the first takeaway, the first really important thing, and this is not talked about much. Um, and mm -hmm. I, I I firmly agree with this. I think this is an amazing observation. It's like pretty much always when the OODA loop comes up, somebody puts up a diagram like this, and it's like, oh, that's what OODA loop looks like. And it's like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, it's not. Well, that's the OODA loop. But the thing is. You can arrange the relations between these different, um, you know, these four stages in different ways. So, can you put up the link I sent you on screen? Can you pull that open? Um, give me a second. I think I can. Because there's basically the, the, you know, the OODA loop isn't an ideal model for how decision making should work. It's it's more just a model of how decision making works in general, and there's lots of different ways in which decision making can operate, and sometimes it can be useful, and it can you know depending on the context, sometimes it can work well, and sometimes it doesn't. So scroll down. We're gonna uh, get to the pictures. Yeah, yeah, I already see like these different arrangements. Like ah, okay, like a normal simulation tuned closed loop, tuned open loop, right. situation yeah, this, tracking. This. Adversary okay. inside your decision circle. So, yeah. so let's look at the tune close loop, for example, right? Sometimes we want to be in a situation where we're just observing, deciding, and acting, and we're just doing that. Like, say we've already figured out our, like, you know, this overall thing, and we're just going to carry out a task for a while. And that's all we're doing. Like in Minecraft or some shit, you're just like, I don't know, you're just doing some farming, and you're like looking for your resource, extracting it, and then going to the next one. You don't need to be like orienting. You don't need to be creating new conceptual models. You're just mm -hmm. doing this one set thing and you're just stuck in the closed loop. And that mm -hmm. might actually work well for whatever situation you're in. On the yeah, other yeah. hand, that might be really bad. Like you might be stuck in this and not be, you know, creating your um like like maybe this this thing, observe, orient, act, uh, observe, decide, act. This is like all the left has been doing. Or maybe all the left is doing yeah, yeah, is like I, 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 I wanted observing. to say that, yeah, yeah. Uh, where's where, where's the only observing? Observe, okay. Actually, the left is probably just observe, orient, observe, orient, observe, orient, right? Like, we're looking uh, and we're kind of modeling and, and then maybe we, like, try and act every now and then and it fails. I don't know, something like this. <laughs> um, but, but, but you see what I'm saying, right? Like, you can mm -hmm. kind of do it and have lots of different forms of the loop. Um, so it's, and, and this is the key, you know, the TLDR of this whole blog post is it's not a loop. It's a diagramming language. That, um, that is, yeah, yeah. I think, I think the, like the, the, like what a diagramming language is like, that's what, that, uh, that was pretty, pretty, uh, like unclear to me, but now that I see it, it's like, okay, it's like, you can, you have like specific steps and you can basically, you run into certain like combinations in certain different orders of these steps where like some are even completely left like untouched and that you can map basically or diagram like specific variations of this using these concepts and like that that is like yeah that is I, like this is super helpful this is super, yeah, super helpful I, I can give you and of course it never does, it's not describing a specific action it's just describing the decision making process right yeah yeah and, of course, yeah, yeah, and, yeah and i can give you like an, an a kind of analogy for like you know how this can play out it's like actually again in games you can see this really well like in valorant you can very easily like at the start of the round you'll be like okay our plan is we're going to go and um we're going to do a like put some pressure on the B bomb site. And that's like our plan for this round. Mm -hmm. And so then you've done your like orienting basically first. That's like the first thing that happened. Um, uh, Cause maybe it's the first round of the game. You have not even had an, ob an opportunity to observe yet. Right? So you, the first thing you're doing is like this orientation step. And then you're in this kind of cycle between observing, deciding and acting when you're like carrying out your actions in the game. But then maybe at a certain point in the round, you're like, oh shit, 
I observed that they they have four people on this bomb site. We shouldn't be here. We're going to get fucked if we try and like take this bomb site. So we need a new plan. So we now have to orient again. And so you know, like now now is the time where we need to reorient and create a new model. Okay, situation has changed. They have heaps of you know. And from the outset, we assumed that they would be spread out across the map, but we've discovered they're all here. New plan. Okay, maybe we like make it look like we're going to A, but we're actually going to dip and go to go to the B bomb site. You know, and then. Once you get there, maybe you you have to do something like this again, right? And often a thing that happens in the games I play is I find that often people play without the orient step much at all. They'll like orient at the beginning of the round, and then that's mm-hmm. like it. They just and people and you can very easily play where you're just going through the motions. You're not really paying attention to what maybe you're not observing very well. Actually, like you're not re- or you're not having a very good relationship between your observe and your orientation. I, f- I find that's often a problem, and that's kind of exactly the thing Boyd is saying, that- right? That you you keep kind of act you keep acting, but without like kind of responding to someone else who's responding to you, um, and it's mm-hmm. really it's like really vicious. Like it's I, I, the thing he says about like which w- who is having the better functioning OODA loop is like very very true. It, it describes very well what happens in a like a high level game of Valorant but- where like if if they're if they're figuring out what you're doing and they're able to like come up with plans that account for what you're doing and you keep your invariant, you just keep doing the same thing again and again, obviously you're going to lose. Um, there's one ex- exception though, what which I, is that like mm-hmm. sometimes action transcends strategy. Um, in, at least in this game, right? Sometimes some skilled motherfucker runs out and just kills, shoots everyone in the head. Mm-hmm. Um, and so this is something we kind of have to account for in our, I think this is something important we have to count, account for in our like, strategic approach here too right sometimes we make yeah. we have this action and it has this like overwhelming effect like massive you know it's it's a it's a um what's the word in um complexity theory it's like a um like oh fuck me um i don't know you, you know what i mean you get this action which is like something pivotal happens you know um this like this deci- like a decisive moment occurs ah uh, tipping point tipping point a tipping point yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah there yeah, we yeah, go yeah, like okay. a tip- you get yeah. a tipping point right like you have to be alert for those and 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 you know you might have had a really bad plan but the strategy might have been fucked but some action that took place as part of the strategy ended up being decisive anyway um and so being able to recognize that and like you know take advantage of it i think is also kind of important what I wanted to ask you, because like uh, as you said, um, with like okay, the like the the short moment of indecision that you had with like okay, hey, um, people cl- play with like not really much of orientation or like the orientating step is like in the beginning, but then it doesn't really occur any time like maybe just in the beginning of each round and that's it, and then you switch to oh well maybe maybe they 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 are not doing like very good observation or like the the link between observation and orientation is fucked like what i want to ask you is like how do you know uh, how do you decide let's like say how do you decide um which like very specific action that you're doing in valorant or someone else is doing in valorant into which category to put this specific action Oh, like, of, of the how observe, do, orient, decide. Yeah, how, yes. I mean, how, how do you know that, like, yeah. one very so, specific thing that happens in Valorant fits yeah. into act, orient, observe, or deciding? I mean, like, how part of you, it, I think, yeah. is that they're not fully, you know, I don't think any of them are ever fully, like, isolated from each other necessarily, right? Because you, and, and also you have, there's the individual players, and each of them is doing this, and then you have the, like, collective organization of your team. And that may or may not have emergent properties. You know what I mean? Like if nobody's mm-hmm. talking to each other and nobody's really paying attention to what each other is doing, then obviously yeah, you're yeah, not going to yeah. get this kind of emergence, right? Whereas if you are, and the more you're doing it, the more, the better the communication is, hmm. um, the better the coordination is, the better the leadership is, the greater your em- emergence is. But like, I don't know, how would I divvy it up? It's like, well, I mean, I guess obviously the um, the kind of like, what you're inputting into the game that's very obviously you're acting right like what i'm clicking on my mouse and my keyboard that's yeah yeah um 
Mm -hmm. and, and where where I'm looking, where I'm like, actually, here's the other thing, right? Like you're, and, and this is pointed out in the blog post. Intuitively, we would think, oh, you orient with your head and you observe with your eyes. Well, you know what I can do? I can observe, I can close my eyes and I can use my hand and I can feel this. And you know what? I'm observing with my hand. I can feel the different textures of the microphone, right? So it's like, it's mm. not sense dependent. It's like more complex. Like these terms are more complex than like, um, you know, basically we can, there's many different ways in which we can observe. Um, mm. But I guess it's it's fundamentally what does observe entail? It's like the gathering of information of let's kind of like raw sense data, right? It's like what's going on in observing. Um, but hmm. it seems, but then it seems like, like as you I said, would call it, I think sensing might be actually a better term for it, perhaps. Hmm. Um, but but then it's it seems like that like as you said, like okay, they are never really closed off from one another. That like okay. Oh, that you could basically have like a nested structure that like oh in every mm -hmm. like let's take like the the act uh the act bubble and then like if you would zoom into the act bubble that there is like an entire OODA loop in the act bubble itself uh which like okay oh acting itself includes um act or observe orient aside or like only a few of them only a few of yeah, these I elements mean, a bunch and, of it too is like a lot of, especially I think the act, at least in a game like Valorant, a lot of what's actually doing the acting is not your conscious mind. It is mm -hmm. like yeah. this muscle memory subconscious shit, which you, and the way you get people get really good at the game is they spend all this time training their like, their like subconscious slash their muscle memory um, mm -hmm. in like aim training and aim labs and shit. So they're just like, you know, clicking on these dots that appear really quickly on their screen so that, you know, like you see somebody else's head, you just like reflexively just flick with your mouse and shoot them, right? Yeah. And it's like, that's not happening. The things that are doing that are not conscious. It's like, and um, what's interesting is um, in that, you know, that, that strategy game or Jorbs, who I mentioned before, who like put out this video about his Bayesian approach to strategy. Some of the things he talks about, it, he's like, some strategic decision making can actually be offloaded to the subconscious mind as well. He talks oh, yeah, about yeah. like, like he made, he made the, he found he made like, um, uh, was going to like, figure out like mathematically a like correct decision in this complicated, you know, card game, but he, he and he was going to do it. And then his like subconscious, like he then subconsciously just like his hand just like didn't do the action that his brain figured out was the correct one. And then he went back and evaluated it later with more time and realized his subconscious had like done it better than his conscious mind. Um, mm -hmm. Which is kind of wild. Like. Hmm. So, but they're still like, okay, maybe this is like a, the, like the sickness of the philosopher inside of me that there's still like this. And maybe that's like, you, like basically the insecure, let's, let's say it like insecurity, like the insecurity of being a, or uns, like, yeah, insecurity, insecurity of being able to like, like determinately say, okay, this or that <laughs> thing is the act step this or that yeah. thing is to observe I mean, step that like um i think we can somewhat and, do this it's like yeah but you know but, yeah but the thing is okay if you like can you also explicate and like really describe the like the the decision making mechanism or like the methodology by which you make that or is it rather like okay you just kind of do it and it kind of works but you don't really know why and it's more of like a heuristic Ooh. intuitive thing I, I think boyd actually does enumerate what some of each of the things involves and his just what he calls orient is kind of interesting right he's like your orient yeah. is informed by all of your prior knowledge including i think he says like your you know he has some weird actually go back to your other no. picture your other diet yeah i, I think I, I, in there. yeah I, I have i have it yeah, yeah the yeah the genetic heritage thing yeah uh, I mean, cultural traditions analysis synthesis previous experience yeah. and new information yeah 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 um no I, I think my I think the 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 overall problem that I'm getting getting at here is like this problem of like okay how do I know that the one specific object is the case of concept A or of concept B how yeah, do I know yeah. that like basically let's take like how do I know that an apple is an apple and not a banana like like let, yeah, yeah, and yeah. the thing is I like, mean, I... yeah you cannot really say why the apple is like you, mm -hmm. you just you just do it and you there is no like really um 
like satisfying justification you can give for that but the thing is you know it works you never had problems with distinguishing an apple and banana in your life probably um and but when it comes to like and it comes to concepts which like are way more abstract and aren't like easily tractable like an apple and a banana where you can say okay this one yeah, corresponds I mean, to this or that sensory experience this one to that or that con- sensory experience it becomes way more easy to like confuse these concepts i mean here here's the fundamental problem right it's like uh you know all that stuff that boyd said about like girdle and the um uh the like uh, completeness right same fucking thing here basically right the model of the oodle loop does not neatly conform to the terrain of decision making the decision making process and like acting in the world right it's so it's where well, it's never going to be perfect um so so you cannot a, mm-hmm. so you cannot like yeah so yeah. you cannot describe what the OODA loop is doing basically in terms in the in the terms using in the terms of, of the, the OODA, OODA, loop. OODA loop but that's true of mm. any any anything mm-hmm. like no um yeah not nothing can be as good as good says right nothing can be like um what were the two terms it's like complete and um is it true I can't uh, remember what the other one complete is. and and or like uh, uh, consistent consistent yeah 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 it's either like non-complete that like okay certain axioms need to be like come from another system or there is like uh, there are paradoxes involved yeah yeah. um mm -hmm. yeah and i guess it's the same here yeah i mean the thing is like if it the thing is like okay logic like we don't have to be interested in like logical paradoxes and these abstract stuff if in the end this actually helps for improving our decision making and analyzing our decision making like um because we are interested in the practical effects in the end i'll tell you one thing right like Mm -hmm. do you know what's a really good way to win a bunch of rounds in a game of valorant to pay attention to what's going on in the game and respond and anticipate in real time so for example right first round their team they go to a most of the time and this is game theory is useful here they're probably going b next round um (laughs) what teams usually do oh we have the same setup we used last round because we don't want we want to make sure if they do come a again we've got people there what do i say well i think like actually if we did a um i bet you i bet you if you statistically modeled valorant um there's probably a like uh decent chance i bet that like maybe 60 percent of the time on the second round teams go to the other bomb site that they went to on the first round they don't go to the same bomb site twice in a row basically right so like what should you do well you should probably like put four dudes on the like the opposite site next round um and then you screw them over uh say you win that round well they're not going to come back to like get screwed over by UNB, so they're going to go back to a so what do you do well everyone go over to a or maybe we think okay this round they're going to play more slowly and they're going to default and wait for us to come to them so we play back on our sites and like play really safe and wait for information and so you kind of have to like you have to it's not just that you have to model like observe what's going on you have to make predictions about what they're going to do and then take be proactive about making decisions right it's not oh i'm going to wait for them to do stuff and then i'm going to respond to it i'm going to try and predict what they're even going to think they're going to do and then i'm going to respond to that right um like that's what my model is going to extend towards um yeah so i so i think it's like what's very 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 powerful is the is the orienting is being able to model like Mm. being able to think okay my opponent put to put your and it's empathy is actually the key skill here the fundamental thing it's like to be Mm. able to situate yourself in the position of your opponent haha another thing the left is terrible at right because we just oh god what's our relationship to the right and the thought of the right it's to just like make it prohibited make it just like Oh, we sh- we would never dare like even talk of these things. They are verboten. Like, yeah, is, I, I, I'm. God forbid you have a copy of Frank Numina on your shelf. <laughs> <laughs> I I actually don't own either Frank Numina or the Accelerationist Reader. I don't yeah, have. I, I have I, a. I have Frank Numina back back in uh, New Zealand. 
That's on my um, parents' bookshelf right now. They don't even know. It. <laughs> they don't. Oh, this book, it's like cursed like, object is in yeah, their house. Yeah, it, it, it will. It will awaken one day and like kill the entire family. Like that's yeah, that's yeah, what's yeah. gonna happen. Um, the the ghosts of England will be trans transferred into that book and like by all yeah, the yeah. computational energy of Bitcoin. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, no, um, what I want, what I want to say, like, uh, like just a shot, like I, I really, really thought like even, uh, especially recently, like I really, really fucking, um, like doubt my own ability for empathy a lot, like a lot. Um, uh, that's like, that's like actually not cool. Um, cause like, yeah, how do, how do I, how do I know? How do I know if I'm good at that or not? Like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, that's, I mean, not everyone is good at it. Is the thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's something that just. But I think it can be learned. I think it's a thing that is like it can be cultivated. I guess. I, is a better way I, of putting I, it. I very much. Yeah, I, I completely agree that. Like, okay, hey, that's also like to a certain extent, like okay, like like socially specific. Like okay, you may be like okay, hey, where did you grow up? What's like your social, your social environment, your social bubble, cultural stuff, etc. You will have like there may be like some more fundamental human stuff, like certain emotions, whereas like okay, hey, certain more specific stuff like, um, like uh, let's say like um, customs and oh, um, what's considered uh, normal or okay or isn't in like a different context, like. You would feel insulted by some stuff, whereas other people might not, and uh, that kind of shit. Like th these basics, um, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You, you never know. Like, is it like, am I actually good at that, or is it like, okay, hey, like, yeah, like, uh, yeah, like, uh, but like this, I this looks like especially this like, um, these different combinations of these steps look really good. I think I'm a little bit too afraid to make mis to still to make mistakes. Like because I'm I always have in my head basically the idea of what if someone would ask me, "Oh, why did you put observe at that point and not at the point where act is? How do you justify your decision there?" I always think about that like what if someone would would uh, question my decision there what could I, mean, I what could i tell them and do what's i actually useful is that's yeah. that itself is empathy that you're no no that's that no process. that's paranoia that's paranoia that's not no <laughs> i i no, trust me trust me it's not empathy that i i feel it's paranoia that i like that i have rather i mean maybe you can harness <laughs> the paranoia to generate empathy <laughs> And I mean, you know, and by empathy, I mean, I don't mean being nice to people. I mean, like, you know, modeling someone else's um, behavior so that you can, like, take advantage of it. Which <laughs> God, it's that like, makes me sound it's so like, evil. It's like, it's like fucking, but it's, it's like dark but, but, empath. It's but, like but dark that's what, he, that's what it is. That's <laughs> what it is. Like, like, it's like, oh my do you know God. what I mean? No, I know. You know, that's what oh my we do. Like we're monsters, you know. Like recently, oh my god! Like, um, uh, I kind of like my best friend awoken awoke the dark side in me a little bit. Um, in 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 so far, like a, a little bit that, but also, um, I would yeah, I can fucking put us on Discord back again, uh, up again. Um, mushroom is is back by the way. Um, oh hey, mushroom. Um. No, like so, my 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 roommate is um, the the psycho roommate is uh, moving oh, out yeah. tomorrow, and like the like, especially in the time where I think we, you missed we, that. But just, I, I just hey. <laughs> the thing is, um, I actually had the idea of like, okay, with Noel, with my other roommate who's staying, if we would do like, we would um. Like sit in front of the stream, drink something, and have like a like a shit chat, uh, uh, like gossip uh, session about him. Oh my god, like, do they, it! Um, yeah. Like I don't know how how comfortable he would be with the situation. Actually, that's and not very English nice. That, that's everything. pretty mean, but it is funny. No, no, yeah, uh, uh, as if I'm nice. I've never said I'm nice. Like who fucking? <laughs> no, but um, so in the in the in the time frame where where we were looking for a new roommate and like really like this entire atmosphere of like let's say like one month like one month ago it started like where it really became like noticeable okay oh your time here is ending 
this is gonna be like only very on, uh, like uh, only very temporary now. Um, and I knew, okay, you know what? Like all of the possible consequences of what I say of like certain conflicts, etc. I will not have to live with them very long. Like, and I can risk th more things now. And I really gained a lot of like self, like self consciousness. And so far, I like like. Oh my god! I started to be like a little bit cruel. Like I started to. Yeah, it sounds like you had a you oriented successfully or effectively here. I, you know what? Like I, so so like the, the rough thing is like like the psycho roommate. Like um, uh, I know, and and this sounds this this sounds kind of wild, but um, his girlfriend trusts me and my other roommate oh, yeah, more than, than her this. her own boyfriend. Like yeah, 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 and like I'm not bullshitting here. It sounds fucking wild, but that's I know I, I know what you mean. I've been in situations and, like that before, um, many yeah. times. I would say actually, oh, like okay, yeah, yeah, okay, and um, like, and the thing like, my other roommate and I also like started to like more make jokes. So the thing is like also. It, the girlfriend of the psycho roommate has seems to be pretty attracted to like my other roommate <laughs> and but the thing is he has like no interest in her he is like has like a relationship that goes like four four years now like long term relationship but blah 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 and like like and we make we made like jokes like er, like everything like we made like so many so many jokes like I started to like and and like I started to provoke when the psycho roommate was with uh, like we just kind of like were in the kitchen and he came and then we started talking a little bit about like relationships and stuff and he uh, and then I like initiated the the kind of like hey Mark so how did you and your your girlfriend actually like get got to know each other and like I like and in a way he didn't realize, but I was like, like, okay, I couldn't say like, oh my God, yeah, your girlfriend doesn't like you anymore. Well, like, uh, but it was like, it was like more enjoyable to myself because I knew I was kind of cruel without him noticing. And, um, it, oh my God. <laughs> but the thing is, yeah, the, I, the, the I, know the, I, know, I know this, um, the, the sometimes motherfucker there's deserves nothing it. more entertaining than like uh, a joke that's just for you inside your own yeah, head. Like, yeah, I, I, I personally make these kinds of jokes for me all the time. This is one of my favorite <laughs> things to do. Um, <laughs> like, um, I don't know. There's something very enjoyable about it. Um, yeah. Yeah. And oh my, like, like we were even so, so evil. Like, I even said like to, to like my other roommate, <laughs> You know, uh, so that's like Mark is the psycho roommate. Noel is the 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 one who's staying, and who I'm like very like we're on very good terms. The good guy, the good guy, yeah. Um, the the Chad, not the virgin. And like, and I'm like, Noel, you know, if you didn't if you didn't have a girlfriend uh, and you were happy, I you know what, I would want you to fuck Amelie so much, like just to just so the girlfriend of Mark, so so. So just that, so just that you do that, and she kind of like cheats on him, and like, and you know what? I would want to sit on the side and watch. Like. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, like, but we it's like so cool to be able to make these jokes now and to know like, oh my god, it's it's like finally yeah, over yeah, and it's, like oh my yeah, god, yeah, 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 of course, of course. Uh, yeah, I mean, insert Zizek, Zizek reference here, I guess, like, um, about the, like, importance of bad jokes or whatever. Man, it's been so oh, long since I watched, like, a Zizek video, but um, <laughs> I guess but he has his moments. Zizek has some, like, I do miss Zizek, Zizek's jokes bangers, to be honest. He had some like, fucking like, killers, let's be real. Like, uh, and also, like... I, 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 like today you would probably like sometimes say like how the fuck did he get away with that like sometimes like like on fucking academic panels and conferences and shit like, I think yeah well it's just because like I don't know he already had accumulated enough power right like or he was like like the 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 bitty alarm that I had the bits alarm that like okay hey um 
embarrass yourself so much that the system doesn't label you as a threat. Yeah, Although, yeah, like, yeah. Zizek has this, okay, th that the, he has a problem that, like, everybody thinks, haha, funny, funny raccoon guy, basically, like, raccoon equivalent, human equivalent of a raccoon guy. Yeah, cocaine um, addicts, like. Yeah, and, like, that's why nobody takes him serious, and that's why he get away, gets away with the jokes, and, but, like, yeah. Um, or it's that, like, you know, everyone pretends to, like, hate them, but actually loves them, you know, there's <laughs> there's that angle. Yeah. Okay, do we have like anything? I really realize I'm getting a little bit tired, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, me um, too. It's getting pretty late. Um, I, I think I, I think Back for Blood should be loaded, but like I did I did let it load uh, overnight. I don't know if it's like downloaded yet completely. Um but there's a good chance there is. And nice, um nice. so like yeah. I'm do you know anyone else who would be we could tempt to join us? I don't know. I could because I like I've been playing on my Valorant Discord, but it's just with kind of like you know normie Valorant bros basically. Okay. Um, whose patience I like? Whose company I um? What's the word? Uh, I would say I like um, tolerate. <laughs> I just wanted. I just. I don't know. It doesn't even fit. I just wanted to make a joke of like. Tolerate and valorate, but it isn't even valorate. It's oh, yeah, valorant yeah, no. and yeah, whatever. <laughs> um, no, I could ask another friend of mine. Um, he is also uh, uh, Xbox One S, but um, I don't know. Like, I don't know how well Back for Blood runs on that. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I mean, how well do you know? How well do you know Dennis? Can we rope him in? We we can we can ask. Like, of course, I can certainly ask him. But uh, Dennis. Like... Dennis, Dennis certainly doesn't have like anything to game on. That's the problem. Oh, um, he doesn't have like a PC or. A... Nah, he he has like a, a MacBook and that's it. Like. Ah, uh, motherfucker. Yeah. Um... That's, he's no true revolutionary mm. if he's just on the MacBook. Mm? Don't tell him I said that. <laughs> I'm just joking. I don't know. <laughs> I don't. That just doesn't even make sense, honestly. <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> Only true gamers are like. <laughs> <laughs> for real though, for real. True gamers, uh, actual strategists, not fucking, I don't know, virgin LARPers. Uh, <laughs> Probably, I think I I'm mean, the virgin LARPer on that side, well, to be well, honest. Let me, let, me, let me extend this metaphor further, right? Who's been kicking our asses the last few years? The all right, what are they? Gamers. Mm. LARPers also. But um, yeah, also LARP. Yeah, was, um, I guess their their LARP can... quotient has steadily increased in the in recent years. But I could like I could ask Sam, also ADH member, uh, like uh, with his Xbox. Um, oh, let's let's make, do it like this. Let's try how it runs on my Xbox, and then sure. I know. Yeah, um, get the data. I can I know who I could ask. Like, all right, yeah. cool, cool, cool. I mean, if we okay. play on um, like easy mode or whatever, we can just like do a run with you and me and some bots, and it'll be fine anyway. Yeah. Okay. On easy easy mode is like, it's so easy. We'll be fine. Easy mode is easy. Even it's... the biggest like it, it's actually the game is hilarious. Like easy is so easy, and then veteran is like pretty hard, and then nightmare is like insane. Like apparently only like the. Only like 0.00001% of like the people who've downloaded the game have like one on on the hardest difficulty. It's like okay, you hold actually shit. obscene, um, which I kind of love. Honestly, okay. more games should be like that. Okay. By the way, like a short short thing. Did you already? Okay. Like yeah, you probably I, I probably recommended this book to you already like a million times, and you said like okay yeah after my PhD. But that was when you didn't had like that much time. Yeah, you know, I like, still. Yeah. Dude, uh, I don't need to fucking read Aristotle right now, motherfucker. Yeah, like... I I I know I know it. Ha like I can still like with regards to like okay yeah um like getting your hands dirty and like like yeah the Kim Stanley Robinson Ministry for the Future, um. Yeah, Amazing. that's what I'm gonna save her. I'm gonna look forward yeah. to that when I'm done. Um, it, it's it's good. It's good. Like I remember, I, I remember, like uh, when I had um, oh god, I did a stream like a month ago or so. Like there was like this uh, when the Andreas Malm how to blow up a pipeline. There was like a an interview he did with the New Yorker, um, and that like 
went like semi viral on Twitter and then like first all the liberals on conservative were like outcrying and then like also then like the the expectable uh leftist infighting came up about that like oh my god um um Malm is um like anti democratic or some shit oh, yeah, and I'm like and tweets about that so uh, and um Lee Phillips was one of the people who did like a long thread and like also like basically claimed the same thing with with um uh KSR and I made like a whole stream reading out the thread commenting on it and then critiquing it and even Lee Phillips himself went, uh, came into my came into the chat really and, yeah 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 uh it was like oh my Ooh. god I was like fucking nervous like I was a nervous wreck because like it was a first timer that I did this format on stream live mm -hmm. I improvised and then the motherfucker himself comes into my into my chat <laughs> and um like I do respect I did I yeah, do respect, respect him for doing the, that. That's cool. Yeah, I do respect him to like um but it like really made me nervous and I think like like basically like Lee Phillips position is like unironically like yeah um um yeah I'm just I'm I'm uh um yeah, Malm wants wants to do like um, property destruction of fossil fuel infrastructure. Um, yeah, I say he should just uh, work for um, for better policies, like just like for better democratic eco policies. And it's like unironically Lee Phillips like really Phillips critique. And like there's like no like okay there is like a minimum of strategic element in that like in that like okay yeah there or the existing eco eco policies aren't enough yeah okay i agree does that mean that like okay yeah therefore everybody and every possible resource at hand should completely be thrown in that and every other alternative should be completely disregarded and uh like simply throwing energy will spark better eco policies that will then save the planet. Here's yeah, here would be uh, my take on it is it's like yeah. are you 100% confident that just working on policy is absolutely better? Is there a possibility that doing shit like this could have a, a useful effect? I don't think anybody could with 100% yeah. certainty argue either position. If that yeah. is the case, then we should take seriously the other possibility. Yes, yeah. It's like it's kind of like this like basically he completely disregarded like as we said like the democracy of ends democracy of means like means that are not democratically chosen themselves. And um like yeah, he, he disregarded any and, kind of means that are uh, that aren't democratically chosen themselves. Like he disregarded the, them the, basically. The naivety of this is yeah. inevitably some means will not be democratically chosen. Yeah, that's it's, also like that's also like yeah, it's yeah, an it's, inevitability. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's 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 the thing. It's like a kind of like a power, like a power fantasy, as if like that's like a thing also with like uh, the the uh, democracy and like okay, hey, over um not overvaluing um um over like assuming you already have like all the democratic decision making capacity in the world or the power where where you don't have that yet and that like okay what you said like n means that aren't democratically chosen will be employed if you want it or not um and uh, it's like and that's like the thing where like okay hey the the recognition if you have or if you have limited power or if your power is already is, is still limited to a certain extent is like okay that's the difference between like okay is it st it's strategic political thing or is it like an ethical thing like right. and and, and if, here's another yeah, yeah. An another spin on this right like okay let's think about the J january 6th right the fucking um you know the right like invading the us capital mm. what did that do it put the left in the position of defending the sanctity of the us capital buildings and like all this fucking sh shit that we should not be cool with, right? Mm. Um, it put us, we were basically like sided with the police and like that that's the position that they put us in by doing that, right? What happens if you blow up a pipeline? Uh, well, you're forcing the like side of conservatism to side with the oil companies, right? To say, oh no, you shouldn't blow up pipelines. That's mm -hmm. good. We want them to be having to take that position, right? We that's want a them good to one. We want them to explicitly be having to own these fucking, like, fucked positions. We want to put them in difficult spots. 
Yeah, that like um, okay, that they are taken away from like okay, that they cannot say okay, hey, we actually provide alternatives like that yeah. because like that's like with the with the greenwashing and like oh, um, um, with like oh, look, we already have like plans, but these are like super super marginal plans and like basically co-engineered with the fossil fuel companies themselves. I mean, that's true for the demo for the fucking Democrats too. But like, yeah, um, and, and then and you know what else you can do. They, they, they'd be like, oh, no, you shouldn't blow up, like, our plants. You'd be like, well, what have you been doing in Iraq the last 10 years, you motherfuckers? Cue video of boiling, like, burning oil. <laughs> <laughs> like, the memes no, right yeah. themselves. Yeah. <laughs> oh my, yeah. Um, how do, you know, like, this fucking conversation really sparked my, my appetite for the podcast, really. Like, I, <laughs> I, I also, no, like, seriously, I also really like this, like, setup of the of the uh like okay yeah it's just like us on discord kind of the audio you yeah. finally figured out your audio like finally <laughs> yeah, the problem. like <laughs> i'm glad it sounds better <laughs> and um yeah it's actually acceptable it's actually good um yeah no i'm 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 really stoked yeah and yeah, yeah we'll make it happen this was fun yeah, yeah i feel like we, we have good like we have good chemistry which i think like you know, we'll make for, like we're, we just we sling some good jokes. I think it's a it's the next the next podcast with two white cis dudes coming up. <laughs> like, let's go, let's go. I, I think let's go. I don't know what it is, but um, for some reason, like um, I don't know. I like I definitely have lots of like kind of I feel like kind of spicy takes, but I'm usually like <laughs> way too polite and like um, what's the word um. Uh, I'm, I'm too strategic to like ever say any of this shit like publicly because I don't want to get deleted, right? Um, but I have a lot of strong convictions around this shit. And for some reason, like there's something about the um, your approach that just makes me be like, ah, oh, fuck it, I'm just gonna say this extremely <laughs> kind like, of, stupid thing. You know what? That, that's good. No, kind of like because like that's like a space. Like basically, that's a space where certain hypotheses and ideas can flourish. Whereas, yeah, like, okay, it's yeah, an eco yeah. it's like an environment. Whereas, like, um, like other environments aren't very like vi like uh, habitable for these ideas. Like, yeah, habit uh, really and um, I mean, it's like not that. Oh my god, this is now the one and only determination. Like, it's a spicy take, or it's like an idea, or it's like a tendency in which we like believe to different degrees into. I, I think we would like we say, okay, hey, this would make sense probably. Uh, but it's like not like oh my god, this now has to happen. Like, like this is it like that there is like the, the, yeah. like, the, like there I, is like yeah i still don't know if i how i feel about fucking blowing up pipelines i don't fucking know like i haven't really thought about yeah. it but like i'm i'm not foreclosing it as like i, I could see it being good like i could bro see it i'm oh. i'm like i'm i'm constantly making the point that like uh like when i also discussed the 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 le phillips article like bro I wouldn't even fucking say that, like, okay, like, I wouldn't even say that, like, okay, you have to stick to property damage, like, uh, yeah, that yeah. there are strategic targets, like, may, maybe, maybe, I don't know, I wouldn't be the one who, who does it, but, um, uh, like, uh, the thing is, like, okay, how do you do it then, like, that, there's, like, a lot of, like, and the thing is, like, also, hey, this kind of stuff, and that's, like, the good thing about, like, also ministry for the future that like like what you would call like eco-terrorism then will very likely be like a part in in our future like if we want it or not kind of and the question is like okay hey there are certain like tendencies which are very likely to arrive uh which are very likely to be realized in our future let's prepare for that and let's ask our like rather than like okay being moralistic yeah, about it and yeah, say yeah. oh no i don't want to have anything to do about it like es especially if it's like, like the eco-fascists who do it first right oh yeah oh <laughs> yeah like, I mean, which is probably <laughs> reclaim the eco reclaim eco-terrorists <laughs> But but I'm just, I mean I'm kind of serious here right like what are the fascists good at doing they're good at doing terrorism they like doing that shit like they do it all the fucking time they're doing it more and more are they like fuck me and yeah like, like I, I like I like the lapping of like um like I uh, um let's be like political special operate like political spec ops political special operatives who like operate somewhat in the dark or somewhat between the shadows. <laughs>
<laughs> like, uh, oh, bro, like, I'm a fucking fan of watching Call of Duty campaigns. Call, like, like walkthroughs of Call of Duty campaigns. Like, I'm a fan of that. I don't know why. I'm, I'm, I'm sometimes think that, okay, there is certain, like, there is a certain way how they present, like, certain imaginaries of futures. Like, especially the ones of the 2010s. Oh, the, yeah, the um, future war, right? Of course. It's uh, interesting. Of, it's... like, okay, yeah, like, how, how, like, because, like, you can, re like, there's a lot of, okay, how is, like, this very popular product, how is geopolitics and war well, imagined? Because it, and it's not just and... a popular product. It's a popular product that is, like, carefully endorsed by the U.S. military. Is it? You know, uh, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's it's what? used as like a kind of recruiting aid. Like oh. there's a there's a kind of there's a very <laughs> the, the U.S. mill is what? like all up in American popular culture, right? Oh, like, okay. So like this, they, because, yeah, no, they, like, you know, yeah. they're often involved in like Holly, the production of Hollywood films, and it's, okay. you know, the same thing with like popular like, war games as well. Like what I what I, the one I recently watched, Call of Duty Ghosts. Um, it's I think like somewhat from the beginnings of the 2010s. It's like has like lich. Oh my god! It's like it's like it's it's like a, it's like a fucking fast and furious kind of plot. It's like so so absurd. It's like it yeah, begins it, begi it begins with okay, the U.S. has like a weapons satellite in space which can like shoot weapons out of like the orbit. And oh, what happens is that um, oh, there's somehow like South America is somewhat like. Um, uh, then, like, oh, there is, like, some force in, like, starts to unite South America, and um, then this force, they're called the Federation, um, and funny thing is that they have, like, the flag, it looks like, kind of like the EU flag a little bit, like, with, like, oh, the ring of stars. And, that's funny. Uh, yeah, and um, they unite South America, and they then hack the US satellite and attack the U.S. with its own weapons. I mean, and this is the then, classic, like, the and, U.S., you're not allowed to have the, like, super weapons. Um, that, the, the that the U.S. Has to be, they, no, like, that's the, we have it, but when yes, you steal ours... Yeah, oh. the, that's, the, that's the thing that comes, like, and then, like, it becomes, like, okay, 10 years later, oh, my God, the U.S. is on the defense. The, the Federation is, like, this, like, uh, blooming, like, military force and, like, everything, and, like, fucking Los Angeles is completely devastated. Like, the US is really, like, on the last line of defense, basically. And um, then, like, there is even a fucking part where you have, like, an undercover, where you are, have, like, a secret mission in the capital of the, of the Federation, which is, like, which looks like a little bit of a futuristic US city, kind of, like. It's, like, really, like, an, uh, like, that's so funny. And then, like, the last mission is, like, no... Oh my god, they used our design of our rocket satellite that we had and they made their own rocket rocket satellites just a little bit smaller and so they have covered the entire orbit and can basically strike anywhere on the globe wherever they want. And like the end is like and no fuck, we must we must uh, prevent that that they launch these satellites and like it's literally like no what the U.S. did in the beginning. No, you are not allowed to do it. If you do it, the world will go under. Like, the world exactly. will end. Classic, classic like, co American copium, basically. <laughs> it's, like, it's, like, really, like, Fast and Furious levels of, of, of story, really, like... Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it's just, it's just, there's just U.S. exceptionalism, right? Like, and, yeah. yeah. But uh, it's funny, right? Fast and the Furious literally has that plot, like, in the... Um, I can't remember which one it is. The, the one with Paul Walker... The like African warlord steals a U.S. drone and starts flying yes! over Los Angeles. Yes, right? yeah, 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 and yeah. It's yeah, like, yeah, oh yeah, 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 oh yeah, we should we fucking hate predator drones now. Like this fucking African warlord has one. It's like he has one drone. It's like motherfuckers, you've been flying fleets of these over Iraq for fucking years. Like, like raining down death and like you know people can't even fucking sleep because they have to listen to this like you know the sound of imminent death just like the you know floating over your house all day. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, like fuck fucking guys. It's fucking laughable. Like the the level of plots involved is is so fucking laughable. Yeah, the um, mental gymnastics. Is... Yeah. Um uh, although I like the um although I like uh the one um that they did uh, Advanced Warfare. 
Um, it's also like a good campaign and like action like stuff. Um, Advanced Warfare is is basically like um, is about a private military contractor, which haha, Kevin Spacey, like the one where Kevin Spacey plays. Uh, Oh uh, yeah, uh, the chef yeah, of a yeah. private military contractor, yeah, yeah. which have like these. They have like the exoskeletons. They have like oh, the most advanced tech, basically uh, military tech, and um, then like it's like kind of and because that game is kind of anti-libertarian. Like it's basically anti-private military contractors. Is that game? Uh, because like in the end, it's like oh yeah, uh, this guy like artificially. Um, artificially creates like crisis uh, crisis points uh, so that uh, the oh, demand can, like, for his co- for, for contracts is is going up and then like in the end it's like oh yeah I want to do like super villain shit and attack like big US cities and global cities so that I'm like the only the only super military force left standing in the world basically um that's like the end. That's like that's like because it's like somewhat anti-libertarian with the point of like okay yeah, military like private military contractors of like military being like private like as 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 bad as militaries are, it's still better that they are under a certain kind of government control rather than like under yeah, of course. private private PMCs, corporate yeah, control. Yeah. Um, that's like that. That's like a level of dystopia. We haven't like okay. Of course, private military contractors are a real thing, but um, yeah, um, you can have hell or you can have hell, hell plus. Like. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, you can have the U.S. or you can have actual Wayland Yutani. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh man. Okay. Which okay. F- funny I mentioned that. I'm actually gonna hop into bed and listen to another like aliens, um, like alien franchise audiobook because they've oh. Audible's put a bunch of them out for free and they're really good. <laughs> cool. Highly recommend Aliens: The Cold Forge. That shit is straight fire. Um, okay. It's, so it's it's like a um, novelization of you know the alien. Have you you've seen the alien movies? I assume. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it has yeah, yeah. been years at this point, but yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's like it's so good, man. So here's the setup the setup for the plot. It's like okay, Whale and Yutani have a like special um, like a space station um, by this like really uh, hostile kind of sun somewhere, star somewhere. Um, where like they're doing three things on the station. It's like they're skunk works. They're like you know secret military research uh satellite or station and they do three things one they're building this like a uh, hardcore um crypto uh like um cryptography system two they're building this fucking intense ai virus thing that just destroys like the sy- whatever systems it comes into contact with and fucks them over and three they're like trying to you know they've got some pet uh captured xenomorphs that they're like doing research onto um but they got they have these three things on the same space station what could go wrong <laughs> um and the the cool thing is that the main character is like a um so she's a like um geneticist who has this like debilitating genetic degenerative genetic condition and so she's dying and her body is failing and so to carry out her like as the chief scientist researching the xenomorphs on the station to carry out the research she has this like a VR connection to uh, um, one of the synth androids. So she actually like jumps into the android and like takes over his body for like when she's doing her work shift. And then when she finishes the shift, you know, she goes back to her own body and like the android goes back to being, you know, himself. Um, so they have this like body sharing arrangement basically. Um, oh, it's a fucking, it's a fucking banger. Um, and yeah, oh yeah, yeah. And the thing that like kicks off the plot is like the external auditor from Wayland Yutani comes in who's like, the ultimate caricature of like the evil psychopathic CEO figure. And mm-hmm. it's like, he prides himself on basically like, I'm the auditor. I show up and I fire a bunch of motherfuckers and get extra money. So like he, that guy shows up at the station to like audit and, and he doesn't know cause it's all covert until he gets there. He doesn't know what actually happens, like what the actual research programs are. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And oh man, it's very entertaining. <laughs> Yeah, I'm gonna. Oh god, uh, I'm in a streak of um, my my favorite or one of my favorite um, uh, ASMR uh, 
voice artists has been doing has been doing um a spooktober oh god it's like it's it's crucial that I, I, I say that it has been doing a spooktober upload month with like every day oh, is nice. a is a voice role play um uh it's <laughs> It's also like kind of meme kind of like uh with like oh every day every day a different monster girl like like kind oh of like... Jesus Christ okay but it's 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 wholesome it's not loot it's 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 like it's like the it's on YouTube they they have banned right. uh the, this this content the, is like yeah. too um what's the word I don't know I, I'm like too much of a boomer like this is like <laughs> too too like Gen Z online for me. Um... <laughs> But that does sound fun, I suppose. Yeah, um, that's that has been like my daily routine, uh, nice, to nice. to to get sleepy. Yeah, recently. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm definitely on the. I mean, I have to admit, the like listening to alien audiobooks is like not a very good formula for sleeping because they're just too entertaining. I just stay awake. But, <laughs> um, what can I do? Uh, yeah. yeah, I have poor impulse control. All right, I better get to sleep. Okay, yeah. Um, that was Peace really up, fun, man. though, man. Yeah, yeah you too. Yes. Thanks for Th having me on, as always. Yeah, and thanks for also, oh my god, like, staying through the entire episode and everything. Fuck yeah, man. It was really, um, I, I mean, I really, like, I mean, it's that thing where, like, when I listen to that episode, it's just, like, it sounds like it's just a big shout-out to me, because it's like... <laughs> 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 and remember, um, there's a part two coming in. Yeah, there's I'm, a part oh, I'm two coming. Hyped. I'm fucking hyped. Um, like, I'm really, I'm really interested. Yeah, Mushroom Mas just said uh, we are great. Um, thank you. And we uh, are. We, thank we, you, Mushroom. We, we plan to do a podcast about basically like strategy and blah 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 whatever with like maybe but, like we still have to figure out the the like the fundamental parameters i still haven't answered kim about that yet uh but like also if like okay hey strategy and the left but it isn't supposed to be like exclusively political and um but like more about like okay strategy like what from time to time political or like maybe yeah uh so a format like that could work is like yeah. each each week we just choose a different kind of like strategic you know innovation moment breakthrough text whatever it is right but, and we like kind of you know i i can I, I don't mind like this is kind of what i'm having to do in my phd anyway so i can just like <laughs> present to you a chunk of this shit and then like, <laughs> you know then we can talk about it yeah uh, so so to master uh stuff like this is coming up like we don't know yet if we're gonna i think we wanted to go with recording first like let we let we try like recording rather than going live first um uh, I I think I wouldn't mind whatever. Uh, I, I'm completely fine with trying recording first and um, yeah, and yeah, it, it, yeah. Uh, I mean, if you say like after that, like, okay, man, you know what? I mean, there's barely okay, mushroom is in chat, but otherwise, like, there's barely anyone really in chat. Um, like, if you if we say if you might come, like, okay, hey, it's kind of like cool feeling to be live. Like, I don't know, but I'm cool yeah, recording. Yeah, we'll yeah. see. We'll see. Yeah. Experimentation. We may need to do it's, some editing as well if we say too much edgy uh, shit. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, and and we wanted to do like music stuff into uh, into it. Um, yeah, true. Yeah. True. Oh, by the way, by the way, what I okay, okay, okay. Give me a second. Oh yes, here. Oh, by the way, mushroom. Um, da -da 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 -dum. here you go. Um, that is like something we've been talking about. Um, oh my god, yes, yes. I needed to show you this. I think I think I showed you this one already. Um. Um no 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 not not languages in fucking oh god no um here I think I've I've already uh I've already uh played this once in a in a mix but I've real I've like uh searched for it um the last like three days ago or so when I was doing the little DJ session and I couldn't find it and I found it again and yeah you're gonna like that. Um. Yeah. What I. I can't hear you anymore. Oh! Oh shit! Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I was yeah. pressing my push to talk. Okay, <laughs> I'm hyped to listen to this. This is like okay. right up my fucking alley. I'm gonna go listen to this right yeah. now. <laughs> okay. All right. Have a good night, everybody. Um, yeah. Thanks so much for you having too. me, Eric. And yeah. Hey. Yeah, catch you soon. Thanks for being here. Bye. Okay. 
Yeah, you're gonna for you to you know what I'm just gonna play it now like one time. Um, wait, uh, where am I even? I don't know. Wait, ah, okay. Haha, here I am. Um, yeah, just gonna just gonna play that as like an outro thing, and then I'm also gonna gonna go offline for today. Yeah. Ah, yes, okay, nice, okay. Lavender game controller, pull up in a game controller. Bitches on the beaches looking super good at gaming. All my friends are Princess Peach, they like to play Smash Brothers. Ice cream's on our tongues because we need a snack Lavender while gaming. Game controller, press down on the right trigger. Sharper stayed at home because he was playing Call of Duty. Playing games and winning games, I'm feeling so alive. Got so many games, I needed to get another external hard drive. All my life, I've been waiting till it's game time. It's game time. All my life, I've been waiting till it's game time. It's game time. So let me game. Needs to know they can't be me at a game. <laughs> Cute, sexy, and I win at every game. You, you know that you can't beat me at a game. So that's game. These guys know they can't beat me at a game. Cute, and I'm always winning at the games. I love games. My favorite thing is just to play a game. So let's game. Okay, yeah. No, I'm. Well, I think I'm gonna catch a shower because I'm a little bit sweaty. Yeah. Um. I don't know if I'm gonna be live tomorrow. Like, no idea to be honest. Um. I think I have to take some time off to do also like some kind of important reflection shit. Um. And and thanks for the pics. Yeah, mushroom. Yeah, give me. Yeah, here's the. Here you go with the. Here you go. <laughs> and how the. F I don't get how you can walk. Uh, not not loud life light. I don't get how you can walk um through through the woods alone in the night. Like, isn't that creepy as fuck? Like, okay, yeah, we kind of like I I get we I I guess we we arrive at the. I didn't send any pics. Huh? <laughs> the orb sent pics. I guess. Um. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Cheers. Peace out. Um. Sleep well. See ya. Um. I'm gonna post on Insta and Twitter when I'm gonna be live again. I don't know if I'm gonna be live tomorrow or the next few days. I will not promise that. Um. But yeah. Um. Peace out. Yes, 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 I am a coward in that regard, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Peace out. <laughs>